So good morning. My clock has just clocked over to nine o'clock. So um, in the interest of trying to start on time and therefore hopefully keep to time, um, welcome everyone. Um, I can't see very many of you, but I know that you're there. Uh, my name is Ian Firth. I'm the chair of the uh, IABC British Group, the British Group of the International Association for Bridge and Structural Engineering. Uh, and as the name implies, it's international. Um, all over the world we have uh, have members and I don't know whether any of you who are uh, joining us this morning uh, or this evening or whatever time of day it is with you are co I mean, coming from outside of the UK but if you are you are most particularly welcome uh, that is one of the joys of course uh, the, the few joys of this new format we are having to live with um, were it not for Covid we'd be meeting in London uh, and having a, a day together and, and, and such a, an important part of the day together uh, we have found over the um, years that we've been doing this now, uh, such an important part is the interaction between people. Very sadly, we don't have that same opportunity in this uh, online format, um, but we make the best of it, uh, the best we can. Uh, and we have an exciting programme uh, put together by a very enthusiastic and very capable young team. So I'd like to start the day by giving thanks to our team of organisers. We'll come back to them again probably at the end of the day. But uh, thank you so much to all of you who put in a lot of time, a lot of effort um, uh, in this. Started way back last year, uh, and then everything had to change, of course, when COVID came along. But anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I absolutely, as the name implies, international, as I say, and it, it deals with bridges, structural engineering, every aspect, every material, every type of, of structure, engineering, architecture. We, we basically deal in the built environment uh, as a whole, as a rule, as an entirety. Uh, and uh, today is a very exciting day. The Future of Design has been running now for, uh, well, some years now, um, uh, eight years in its current format, but uh, rather more than that in, a, in, an, earlier, um, in an earlier format. Um, and the intention is just to have an opportunity to hear from some people who are doing some really exciting stuff, uh, working on, on projects, uh, quite a wide variety of projects. Uh, but there's a real young members um, and a young person's focus with uh, the Future of Design event. We get a lot of activity from young people and as you'll see in the programme this afternoon we have um, some presentations from uh, shortlisted entries from the Young Designers competition which we've been running uh, over the last month or two. So uh, <clears throat> we would often have uh, young presenters presenting to us with a sort of competitive element to it There'll be women, uh, uh, there'll be uh, seminars, there'll be workshops, all sorts of things going on in a very lively uh, day. So let's hope that this time next year we'll be back face to face together, um, enjoying um, the, 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 the sort of cut and thrust of the discussion that goes around an event such as this. Thanks also to our sponsors, Arup and Coley, uh, listed there, uh, who have enabled this to happen. Uh, really, without without that, we would not be able to, to manage. Just a couple of announcements before we kick off. Um, please keep your microphones off uh, unless uh, you are invited to speak. I think uh, we, we're basically dealing with the Q&A uh, in, in writing. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. If you want to say something, um, go in there and write something. Uh, you can, I just had a message from a friend, which is really nice. Somebody can do, you can do a private one, uh, but you can also do um, uh, a general question and we would have people who are looking at those and we will then feed some of those questions into the discussion time. Uh, we can't guarantee to pick up every single one but we'll make sure we try and cover the, the range of interests that are represented by those questions. So please get your fingers ready on the Q&A uh, so we can get lots of discussion going. There'll be discussion after each of the speakers and then again a general discussion period at the end of each session so that we can have a bit of a debate with the, with the panellists. Just one other thing to announce, um, the Nethercott Prize, this is a, a paper prize, writing a paper um, on a topic um, which uh, we, um, basically is up to you, but we have um, uh, launched this a few years ago um, and you can find details on our website. Uh, we'll be talking about the website, iabsi.org.uk. Do go in there, find details of the Nethercott Prize. Um, we need to submit it, I think it's by the 10th, no, it's going to be submitted by, it says so somewhere, I think it was the 9th of October from memory. Um, uh, and um, uh, the prize will be awarded on the 10th of November alongside the Mill Medal about which more later. 
So, uh, without further um, anything from me, let's go straight into our first speaker. Uh, we're delighted to have Steve Fernandez with us from Arab. Um, he's going to speak to us about the reuse and transformation of existing buildings. And this could not be more important or more topical at the time, at this time of climate crisis, as we talk about the construction industry and the damage we're doing to the planet. So, um, it's such an important issue to make the best of our existing facilities and stock um, rather than building new stuff. So, um, Steve, let's uh, hear what you have to say to us. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, so, my name is Steve Fernandez. I'm an Associate Director at Arup, and I'm going to talk about the reuse and transformation of existing buildings. And as Ian said, this is, this is such an important topic and something um, that I'm seeing more and more um, in, in, in the construction industry. Um, the reason behind it is that the, the built environment is a, it's a major contributor towards climate change um, and demolishing existing buildings and replacing them with new ones. It will continue to stress our natural resources. And some of you may be aware of this, but um, there's a global petition called Construction Declares. Um, and this is for the construction industry and built environment. And it's a public declaration that there's a, a climate and biodiversity emergency crisis. Um, so we as engineers, architects and designers, we can play a vital role um, to, to tackle this problem. Um, and there are a number of practices um, that have added their names to this petition um, to make a public commitment to, towards positive change. And, and um, the construction declares, it says that upgrading existing buildings is a carbon efficient alternative to demolition and new build. So many people think that reusing existing buildings is a compromise, um, but you know, we can challenge that perception. And there are countless examples where existing buildings have been transformed into some of the most exciting uh, and dynamic places in the built environment, but imagination is needed. You know, we need to, um, to be able to identify that potential um, because there are just so many missed opportunities um, with existing buildings. And, and hopefully, you know, I can, I, I can sort of give you a snapshot into some of those uh, innovative thinkings and approaches. Uh, and this, this slide, this shows the Museum of Contemporary Art Africa in, in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and this was a, a, a converted concrete grain silo. So, it really illustrates how we can reimagine those existing structures. So uh, at the top left, you can see the existing concrete structure, um, which was used for, for storing grain. Um, the building was redundant and spaces have been carved out of the concrete tubes just to give the structure a completely new lease of life. So, you know, this, this shows that we do have that vital role to, to play in um, reusing and, and transforming existing buildings. So I'm going to talk to you about a few projects that I've been involved with personally, um, just to give you a bit of an insight into uh, some of the challenges and uh, the, that sort of transformation that I've seen. Um, so the first project is the regeneration of the Newton and Arkwright buildings at Nottingham Trent University. So this is a university campus um, and there are two very large buildings here. So one is was a Victorian building built in 1877. So that's the building on the left. And this was called the Arkwright building. And on the right, you can see a nine story uh, tower. So this was built in the 1950s and is known as the Newton Tower. So in Nottingham, both of these buildings are iconic in the city center and their heritage structures. So they're both listed, they're both grade two star listed. Um, but the buildings, they were, they were unsuitable for the university for current teaching. So, you know, not really appropriate. Um, but we didn't just demolish and rebuild them. Um, part the objectives that we were trying to work towards was to create a main entrance um, onto the campus, create this new social heart uh, for the university. Um, it was important to improve connections between the two buildings because they didn't really interact with each other. And we really had wanted to enhance those, uh, the, those existing heritage aspects of the buildings. And, and equally, we wanted to do a number of other things just to improve the performance. We wanted to create some open space on the campus, create state-of-the-art teaching spaces, 
and provide a unified identity for the university. So quite bold and ambitious uh, objectives. So this gives you a bit of context. So you can see the, the two buildings here uh, with the Newton Tower on the left-hand side. So you can see that nine-story tower clad with Portland stone. So it's quite dominating. And on the left, you can see the Arkwright build, uh, sorry, on the right, you can see the Arkwright building. So that Victorian uh, brick uh, building. And the two buildings didn't really interact. You can see that they, they weren't in a fantastic state. Um, and that we were gonna carry out some radical interventions with the existing buildings. So the scheme we came up with, it involves some major remodeling. Uh, so there was some refurbishment, but the remodeling was the, the areas shown in blue, um, where new structures and buildings were inserted in those areas. And the pink areas show demolition just to create some open space and improve that connectivity between the buildings. Um, and this just shows that transformation. It's, it's, it's just quite good to see the before and after, how radically different um, the, the, the buildings are. Um, and I'm just going to go into a, a few of the, the sort of challenges that, that we went through to achieve this. So these plans show the before and after. So on the left hand side, you can see the existing. So the Arkwright building, that Victorian building at the top, uh, and the new 1950s Newton Tower at the bottom. Um, so with the Arkwright building, there was a bit of a mess. There was a bit of a jumble of different spaces and buildings. And what we wanted to do is on the right, where you can see there's a much clear logical uh, plan, the footprint of the building with the Arkwright being a sort of horseshoe shape. Uh, the Newton Tower was then just um, enhanced, opened up, and the green area in the middle is a new entrance gateway onto that campus. Um, so, as I said, very ambitious scheme. Um, and in order to, to carry out some of the works, there was some clever engineering that went into that. So to create that open space uh, in the Arkwright building, there was a large amount of demolition. Um, and here you can see one of the buildings that was quite a, an important building on the, on, on, in that area. So it's called the chemistry building in red. And this building had to be retained, but you can see that it was surrounded by a number of other existing buildings. So only one elevation or half of an elevation was uh, external. The rest of it was all internal, uh, surrounded by these other buildings. And on the right, you can see the, that space within the chemistry building. So not very inspiring at all. Um, so we needed to plan the works quite carefully. Um, and one of the things that we want to do is really to remove the existing walls. Um, we had to prop the roof um, and, and remodel it entirely. The, the real challenge that we had here was that the building was believed to be founded on rock, um, but the ground investigation revealed that it was actually sitting on pretty rubbish material. So we're really concerned about settlement. So this is the sequence of works. We installed some piles, uh, pile foundations within the building. So um, inside the footprint of the building, cast the capping beams. Um, we then installed some temporary props because we had to retain the existing roof structure. It was all listed and it was an important heritage aspect. Um, that allowed those walls to then be removed. We then constructed new foundations externally and then rebuilt the walls. So in theory, it sounds really straightforward, but when you see these pictures, you'll see just how extensive and major this was. So this shows that propping. You can see the existing roof in place there and we effectively had to demolish a number of those existing walls, construct new foundations um, and then rebuild and remodel those walls, which as I said previously were internal walls, um, but now would be external. So just but remember what that looks like. This is now how that building has been transformed. So you can see that vast open space, that this is a new courtyard space that was created around that chemistry building. And those walls have been entirely remodeled. So, so a huge amount of engineering in order to, to sort of deliver this. And even internally, looking at those spaces on the left hand side, you can see what that space looked like originally and how the space has been transformed on the right. And that was only possible through those sorts of major engineering interventions. Um, and in complete contrast, the Newton Tower, so this is the 1950s tower. Um, this, this building contained labs, cellular spaces, and lots of dark corridors. So it was a really underused building. And 
our scheme was to try and open up the entire uh, lower two floors of that building just to just to kind of create a much more inviting space so open it up entirely but one of the real challenges that we had to do that was that the base of the tower had a number of solid walls and these were providing stability for the tower so stopping the building falling over but also supporting nine stories of stone um, because the building's all clad in stone so it was a real challenge for us to, to try and remove and open up that lower level um, but also carry on providing the support for the stone and also provide lateral stability for the building. So again, the construction had to be carefully planned. And these are some of my early sketches, just trying to figure out how can we install the works? It's not just about the final solution. It was about the, the, sort of the whole sequence. And my, my idea here was that we, we would have a temporary frame, install a temporary frame that would provide that support vertically and the lateral stability, allowing a new goalpost frame to then be introduced, allowing all of the walls to be opened up entirely. And um, this probably makes more sense when you look at the construction photos. So on the left hand side, you can see those solid masonry walls at the bottom of the tower. So above this, you've got nine stories of stonework above. Um, this is one of the temporary frames that was installed in front of the existing so effectively needling in, in to provide that vertical and horizontal support. Once that temporary frame was in place, the brickwork, all of that solid wall could be removed below that. So that's the picture that you can see on the right hand side. Um, once that was completely removed, we could then introduce these goalpost frames. So on the right, you can see the, the light grey, that goalpost frame being installed. Um, and this then just helped to open up that space. Um, and this is the transformation. So this is now what that space looks like. So, you know, it looks very different to what it looked like previously. And it's very light, very airy, um, and it's, it's a complete transformation. And just, just to sort of illustrate that transformation, this is what the space at the base of that building looked like. So it was a, it was a loading bay, it was used for parking, um, very dark and dingy. And this is now what that that area looks like. So again, you know, it's lots of people mill around and they, you know, they want to be in that space. And the space between the two buildings, on the left, you can just see part of the Arkwright building with the Newton Tower on the right. Uh, and that wedge of space in between the buildings was just used for parking. Um, this is how that's been transformed. So this has become the gateway, the heart of the campus. It's a really vibrant uh, and social space. So a real transformation. Um, of the space both within the building and also around it. So the next project that I just want to talk about, again it's in Nottingham but it's a completely different scale. Uh, this is a, a library at the University of Nottingham and the existing building, it was a concrete structure so it's a very rectilinear, uh, effectively a concrete box. Um, it served its purpose at the time but for uh, sort of today's teaching and, and sort of learning requirements, it just didn't really meet uh, the, the needs of the university. So you can see that the internal space here, it was not very inspiring, minimal floor to ceiling heights, not very much natural light. It was a horrible space to, to work and study in. So the objectives here, we, we wanted to, uh, the client wanted to improve the way that the library worked. Uh, we wanted to create a light and airy space. We needed to improve the connections, uh, manage people flow within the building. Uh, we wanted to create student friendly places, but most importantly, we had to ensure that the, the building remained operational throughout the work. So this was a 24 seven library. Um, it had to be open throughout all of the construction works. So this was our concept, quite, quite radical here in that you had this concrete box and we wanted to effectively double the size of that building and we decided to build above. So introducing a new floor over the top of the building, introduce a new level below. So introducing new basement area, um, removing all of the existing columns on one side of the building, and then extending out with an atrium space that, that then opened up into the existing, and then a new extension to effectively double the size of the building. So this is a cross section through the building. So you can see that rectilinear box of the existing. And this was our, our proposal. So we we're gonna introduce a new basement below, 
building a new floor above, a new atrium space next to the existing, and then a new extension to the right hand side. So this is a 3D model. Um, it shows that it gives you an idea of the geometry of the building with the existing building on the left and this sort of curvy uh, extension on the right. Um, and this, again, the engineering um, was an important part of this. So this, this is a construction photo showing effectively the, the building being propped. So the steel frame that you can see there is providing all of the support and it's clamped on a column. So you can just see the excavation happening underneath that column. So that's an existing column and the building was completely occupied. So there were four stories above this with people using that library whilst we were taking out the foundations, removing the column, extending that column and then introducing a new level below um, the existing building. So quite radical works to, in order to introduce a new basement underneath that. Um, I talked also about the, the existing columns. So, you know, you saw the, the, the view of the existing building. You've got a number of slender concrete columns around the perimeter, but um, what we wanted to do is open up that space, ensure that natural light would spill into that existing building, create that nice light and airy environment. And the only way we could really do that is to remove some of these columns, but obviously the columns provide the vertical support for the building. So what we came up with here was an engineering solution where we would construct a new concrete structure wrapped around part of the existing. So in the back, you can see those existing concrete fins. You've got a new concrete structure installed in front of that. Um, once this was in place, we were then able to whip out all of the existing behind and just open up that space so that it becomes a much lighter and airy environment. And this is how that's been transformed. So on the sort of left-hand side of both of the photos, you can see that's the existing building. Um, originally, you had those concrete fins, those columns at about one meter centers, and we've just opened that up entirely and borrowed light comes in from this light and airy atrium into that existing building. So it's a really, really nice environment to, to work and, and uh, study in. So just to sort of illustrate that again, this is what the existing building looked like, very dark and dingy. And this is that transformation, you know, the space is a light, airy, um, and it's a fantastic environment. And externally, it was also, it was all unified. It was all wrapped with a, a continuous facade so that it still looks like one building. It doesn't look like an extension onto uh, an, an old concrete structure. And lastly, just to talk about Coal Drops Yard. So this is in London, in the King's Cross area. Um, and here there are two Victorian brick buildings. They were both built in the 1850s. Um, and these were used for the distribution of coal at the time. So coal arrived from the north of England by train. Uh, it was then um, uh, dropped into the buildings, hence the name Coal Drops. Um, and then transported around central London by canal. But as the use of coal declined, the buildings were then abandoned and over time they just started to deteriorate. And you can just see on the, the, the building on the right, uh, in the background, part of the roof is missing. So there was a fire and it lost part of its roof. So the buildings were in a really, really poor state. Um, so the objectives here were to transform and restore these two Victorian warehouses. We wanted to preserve their historic character, but also quite ambitious here in, in creating a dynamic um, a new public space and also to create a, a retail destination uh, and generate a real heart uh, for the development. So this could then host concerts and performances. So this is the concept. Um, it was to, to, to create a, a breathtaking sculptural roof um, that would then unify the two buildings. So we wanted to create a, a dramatic retail space, um, which would then float over um, this public plaza beneath. And you know, the, in the modern day, things have changed. And I think this, was, this really demonstrates that, that the fact that we're able to use 3D printing and digital modeling, um, it allowed the team to cycle through multiple iterations uh, of designs in, in sort of rapid succession. So we're able to test and test and throw things away and restart again. So it's a fantastic way to, to, to kind of generate those sorts of ideas and develop concepts.
Um, we wanted it to. We wanted to create a destination that would draw visitors um, to the buildings and the area. And again, the engineering was massive for this. So we need to, needed to restore the existing buildings. So this involved carrying out. Um, a forensic assessment. We needed to understand the structural arrangement and condition of the existing buildings. We discovered decayed timber, cracked masonry, corroded ironwork, um, and there was extensive structural deterioration. So we had to assess the load carrying capacity and we designed strengthening and repair. So that's the existing structures. Um, we also had this fantastic new roof. So this, the roof, as you can see, it peels away from the existing roof, it curves outwards and upwards, and it comes together at a single point, which is known as the kissing point. So this is the only point where the two buildings meet. Structurally, it's a tied A-frame, so it's very efficient, um, with the A-frame spanning between the shortest points between the two buildings. And you could just about see that the, the V-shaped component at the top. So this forms that kissing point. Um, so it maintains that structural roof profile, but transforces, uh, transfers large forces across um, this critical junction. Um, and lastly, it was just from this roof, uh, the, the, that retail space is then hung from that roof, which creates this floating space over the public plaza. So transferring those initial sketches into the 3D model. So here you can see the, the sort of complexity, how that structure interacts with the existing. Um, and again, as with the other two examples, the, the construction was meticulously planned to thread into the existing structure um, and quite major piece of sort of structural engineering to form those very large structures, uh, the roof form. And here's a photo during construction. So, you know, you can see the, the sort of the, the, the intensity of the construction. Um, as the works were progressing, that roof form take, starting to take shape. And this is what it looks like now. So you can see that this development has created a vibrant city quarter. Uh, there are boutiques, restaurants, bars, cafes, and public spaces, and it's really uh, transformed and enhanced um, the space and the buildings. So it, just in conclusion, hopefully I, I've, I've helped to demonstrate that it is possible not only to reuse existing buildings, but to, to really inject new life into them. Um, and the fact that you know, we need to, to think quite hard and novel engineering solutions, they can help to um, successfully adapt to existing buildings. So not just simply demolishing and rebuilding them, um, but you know, inject new life into them. And you know, we need to be bold and creative. Great, Steve, thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, thank you for keeping pretty much the time. So well done. Uh, first speaker, let's have uh, some questions. I can see we've already got a few, and in fact, a couple of them are very much along the lines of the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, in the introduction, we talked about uh, the need to really be mindful always of the carbon content of what we're doing um, and minimizing the carbon. As we know, we've got to get to zero, not just minimum. Um, so um, question number one uh, from somebody who doesn't want to be known. Um, what were the percentage carbon savings of the renovations versus taking down and exist the existing buildings and starting from scratch? In each case, you did quite a bit of additional work. You weren't just sort of renovating, you were extending. So there's quite a lot of new build, I was going to say, uh, in my comment, uh, in each case. Um, what, did, was there an evaluation of uh, the, the pros and cons of knocking down, starting from scratch versus what you've done and, and a, a carbon balance in, those, in that calculation? I think, uh, to, to be fair, um, th these are projects that have been completed, and I think at that time it was less, uh, the sort of carbon calculations were, were, were less critical. Um, but you, you, you're right that there's, there is an extensive amount of rebuild, um, but, but also that was just due to the client requirements. So, you know, that they, they, they wanted more space. Um, so it's a combination of reusing the existing where possible um, and introducing new spaces as well. So it's, it, it, if, if it was a, a you know, if, if say the area of the buildings were to be maintained, then I don't think we would have had as much new build. Um, in this case, we're trying to cram, in, in, in the modern day, we're trying to cram a lot of space into 
existing buildings. But what, what we did is we, we tried to utilize the existing buildings as much as possible. So for example, in the Newton and Arkwright buildings, we needed new lecture theatres. And much of the existing buildings couldn't really be used for lecture theatres with say 100 people in there. So mm. we had to build new spaces that could accommodate lecture theatres, but then we used existing spaces for... No, sure. No, that's understood. I mean, and I think one of the challenges we're going to be facing as we go forward is how do we, um, should we say, constrain a client's ambitions, um, mm. which is a tricky one. And I'm sure we'll be talking about that during the day um, because we're going to have to. Um, somebody says we want lots of new buildings. We're going to have to say, well, actually, no, you've got to make, use of, make better use of what you've got. Um, mm. And that actually is a real challenge for us in the zero carbon economy. Um, but we'll come to that a bit more. I mean, there's just sort of the adjunct question, of course, what criteria would you use if you were to be doing that calculation um, to decide whether to renovate versus build, build new? I think, I think there's, there, there, there are a number of considerations as well, and it's, 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 uh, it's not just the building itself, it's the whole construction process, because if you, for example, on the, the, the library project, um, we, we kept the building fully occupied. And if it, if it was a knockdown rebuild, you may end up having to have um, temporary accommodation. And all of that adds to the carbon footprint. What do you do? What do you do with the decamped? How do you move people out of the building? And, and all of that does add to the sort of the carbon offsetting. Sure, sure, sure. No, fair enough. Um, do keep, keep the questions coming. I can see they're beginning to roll in. I mean, I think, the, again, the question for the future, same on the same sort of subject, you know, how, if we were designing new buildings now, uh, question from Charlotte Murphy, how would we design them to make them uh, more appropriate for renovation in the future, easier to renovate? Any clues, any ideas? Uh, yeah, so this is something that, I, again, I'm seeing more and more of that we're, we're designing buildings. And there's two approaches. One is that you future-proof them. Um, and, and I think maybe about 10 years ago, I was probably seeing more of that where clients would say, we want our building future-proof. But if you future-proof a building, you, you may end up adding a lot of extra cost into it. Because, you know, if, you, if you're, say, designing it as an office and you maybe want to convert it into... Uh, retail in the future you you may have to design the structure to carry more loads you may end up having to design for longer spans and that adds to the sort of carbon footprint because you're you're over effectively over designing it on day one for something that may or may not happen in in 50 years time the other alternative is that you think quite carefully about what could happen in the future so a, a good example of this is say for example a car park you know you might but today, a car park is needed because everybody's using cars. But in the future, we may not need car, park, car parking. But do you design that structure to have, say, taller floor to ceiling heights, higher loads? Or do you just design parts of it? So it may be that around the perimeter, you could convert the perimeter into retail space. So, yeah, yeah, or, or, yeah. or maybe you just okay. do it at the lower levels. So you have a higher floor to ceiling height at the lower level, and then you don't over-design the upper floors. So I think this is where we need to, as designers, we need to think quite carefully about what do we want on day one? What could happen in the future? And how can we adapt it? But we don't want to over-design. No, absolutely right. And, and of course, we have to do that. But, but, but adaptation and the use of, you know, reusable components and all that sort of stuff has to become part of our everyday thinking, doesn't it? Um, I mean, in the time scale that you had on these projects, uh, you know, did you you know, make changes uh, to, to improve the outcomes from, on this, uh, on this, from this point of view? Yeah, new we did, yeah. New, I think new technology is coming along as, as you were developing it. I, th I think that, that has to happen, and even your methodology for doing the works, and even you have to have a very, very open mind about how you do things, even, even construction techniques. So on the library, we ended up um, incorporating things like vibro de demolition, so using water jets, um, there was controlled demolition using um, explosives and, and technologies were sort of changing throughout and it just meant that you would have with a new technology you may have to revisit the approach how, how does it how does it work you know for, uh, hopefully I've illustrated it's not just about the, the sure. final solution it's the whole construction process has to be considered holistically yeah. and all of those techniques do have an impact on how you, you know, how you actually build it Good. Well, thank you very much indeed, Steve. Um, really, really great start to our to our sessions today. 
Um, and uh, I was very delighted in, in the middle of all of that to see some really good, uh, clear hand sketches from you. Um, you said they were yours. If they were, well done. Um, it's a particular bugbear of mine. We forgot we're losing that skill. So let's, uh, let's keep that one alive. Good. Let's move on to our second speaker. Thank you very much, Steve. Our second speaker, Sahar Fatima, um, from, um, is going to be speaking to us. She did her uh, master's degree in, in Stockholm, and she's going to be speaking to us about uh, informal use of spaces under bridges and flyovers in Karachi, Pakistan. Um, making use of spaces under bridges sounds like a good plan. Um, for Saha, speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, can everyone see my screen? Uh, so, thank you, Ian. Um, my project is called Solace Under Shade, and it's talking about the informal use of spaces under bridges and flyovers in Karachi, Pakistan. This thesis is in three parts. Part one is the story. Karachi is a mega city on the coast of Pakistan with the country's largest port and industry. It's known as an instant city due to its rapid expansion post partition of India. It was the first capital of Pakistan, but this was only for a few years before the capital was shifted north. At this point, it lacked the funding to cope with its growing population, resulting in poor and inadequate infrastructure. Today, it's a city of roughly 21 million and of incredible density. It suffers from terrible traffic, a lack of public space, and very high levels of pollution. The climate is hot and humid most of the time, with intense and deadly heat waves about once a year. Since the turn of the century, the government has made massive upgrades to the road network in an attempt to relieve this congestion. I looked at a few of these upgrade schemes to understand the pros and cons that they provide to the city. Signal-free corridors and arterial roads have been created by constructing underpasses and flyovers. And it's under these flyovers that void pieces of real estate can be found. The connotations of spaces under bridges globally is a poor one. They're associated with crime, homelessness, drug abuse, etc. And they're often problematic areas, particularly in big cities. Pakistanis, however, take pride in their ability to do jugaad. This is an Urdu term that's used to describe low-cost, creative solutions to problems. They can involve using local resources to create or repair structures or alter their uses. Across Karachi, this practice is exercised frequently under bridges. Citizens have taken advantage of these void spaces and the shade that's cast over them by the bridge and a diverse range of activities can be found taking place here. This, for example, is an entertainment venue and a food street under a port-owned bridge. Some of them are legal, like this collection of charity organizations, a soup kitchen, a chest pain clinic, and a youth center that are established here with permission from the landowner. And some of them are not, like this footpath school set up in an affluent area where children would be sent to beg. Providing them with an education, uniform, books, and even pocket money, this charity transformed the lives and futures of these children. This one particularly struck me because the resources were so simple, some fences, some tables, and some chairs. The government eventually evicted them on the grounds of illegal land use and rehoused them in a nearby building. While the building perhaps is a better environment for the kids, in an article interviewing one of the founders of the school, she expressed concern over not being able to bring more kids in because the visibility of this school was its biggest asset. At the start of this project, I spent two weeks in Karachi visiting these spaces and tracing their stories. I spoke to people who were inhabiting these spaces and where possible to landowners to try and understand the current state and the likely future of these spaces. This one is a particularly large flyover where an entire neighborhood market has developed. Currently, it's entirely informal with very temporary structures and the occupants are ready to flee at any moment. Most did not want to talk or have their faces in photos. One of the most recent infrastructure schemes to affect the city is the introduction of Karachi's first piece of mass public transport. The city is introducing a BRT bus rapid transit network with the first line currently under construction. BRT functions similarly to a metro by constructing lanes that are totally segregated from regular traffic. And where this was not possible, the construction of underpasses, flyovers and tunnels allows for an uninterrupted route. The Green Line BRT is nearing completion with lanes and structures built and work currently underway on the stations. Construction began in 2016 and slowly signs of inhabitation are slowly signs of inhabitation have begun to appear underneath it. So based on the case studies I looked at, I've made a projection of its future. The encroachment will become more and more prominent, leaving, leading to a clash between municipal landowners and people using it, and this will ultimately result in eviction. 
As an alternative to this disappointing fate, I propose to act as a mediator between public users and municipal landowners. By anticipating the needs of one and potential benefits to the other, I'd like to develop a project that keeps both parties happy, with the hope that the potential of these few spaces can be seen in an ever densifying city, and that perhaps they're considered as part of the project the next time a flyover is planned. Part two, the site. For this project, I've chosen to look at the most central structure of the route. This is a 1.6 kilometer long, nine and a half meter wide flyover with two bus stations. The nature of the BRT means that this flyover is different to the typical Kaiwei case study. It's a narrower structure, it carries only two lanes, and instead of perpendicular to the world below it, it runs parallel following the course of the road. This has in turn affected the use of the space underneath, as it's all quite visible to the public. The spatial qualities of this site, such as the design of the structure, create room-like spaces to be occupied. And so through observing conversations, photography and drawing, I began to map and study the activities that are currently taking place under this structure. I compiled them into an elevation documenting how it's inhabited. And here are some images of what's going on along the route. A common theme that I noticed amongst the usage taking place was care and servicing of the diverse variety of road users that can be found on the streets of Karachi. And so I sorted them into three categories, people, animals, and vehicles. These three have needs that vary from each other. However, the common requirements that unite them are shade, protection from pollution, and safe access to and from the site. These will form key principles of my proposal, which is to provide a sort of service station for each of these categories. The location of these interventions would remain where the user group currently informally exists. They've drawn themselves to these parts of the structure as the qualities of the surroundings match their needs. And so, at the launch of the structure, a service station for animals of the road to encourage care for them and to allow them to rest and recover. At the intersection, a service station for people to return some of the public space that the city is currently lacking. And at the stretch between the two bus stops, a service station for vehicles to encourage a more sustainable flow of the road. Part three, the solutions. In order to make this project something achievable, the solutions I'm looking at needed to be low cost, provide employment and generate income. A set of techniques that vary in their level of intervention and cost can be used to design effective solutions. And so I will keep these principles of shade, access and pollution in mind throughout. Another thing to note is that site-wide improvements can and should be made to the, improve the urban quality of the area. So proposal one for animals. The care station for animals currently looks like this. It's at the start of the flyover where the structure is at its lowest and the paving of the undercroft is the full width of the bridge. Currently, it's being used for parking of horse carriages and a horse can be found tethered there. The animal care station aims to provide a space within the city to give road animals a space to rest and recuperate. This includes both herded farm animals and work animals that carry loads and wagons. Donkeys, horses, cows, goats, etc., are very much a part of the day-to-day -day life of many workers on the streets of Karachi. So this care station aims to encourage care and love for these animals so that they can be healthy and happy and also more efficient. The space will include place to mount and dismount, parking area for wagons and carriages, and a pen to safely leave your animal in. The pen will have a soft earth ground for the comfort of these animals, and a chain link fence will contain it. Between the fence and the soft ground will be a paved path for access, as well as to deter animals from approaching the fence. This would allow them to be left untethered without worry of them wandering into the road. Food and water will be provided on site with a loading bay for delivery and cleaning access at the end of the strip. This proposal aims to show the possibility to make a functional space with minimal cost and intervention. The sale of food and water combined with a nominal parking fee will have the potential to bring in revenue that can contribute to the maintenance cost. Providing a safe space for road animals to prevent fatigue requires very little intervention and has huge reward. The second one is for people. This proposal is situated at the main junction, taking advantage of verge spaces that are created by the intersection. Two triangular plots currently containing a small green space are fenced off to the public. And I've often observed people sitting against this face, fence, taking a break and socializing in the shade. The addition of pavilions onto these verges extends the amount of space that is shaded and creates a semi-enclosed yet still outdoor public space. The program of these spaces aims to provide access to a diverse group of people. 
One plot will function as a food court with stations for vendors under the bridge and the other as a public street library, examples of which have started to become popular in different parts of the city. The design of the pavilions is considered so that a standard of beauty and functionality can be achieved. A corrugated steel roof is inclined to face the undercroft in the direction of prevailing winds, and the timber trusses have a constant base point so that they become deeper as the spans increase. A lattice truss showcases local craftsmanship, and a half-height wall helps to contain the space. Dense vegetation will screen it from the roads. This proposal shows what can be achieved with a slightly higher budget out of a site that was otherwise serving visual purposes only. The Food Corps Pavilion generates an income by renting spots to the vendors, and the library provides a cultural asset and creates a moment of calm amongst the chaos of the city. The third one, for vehicles. The intervention for vehicles is along the stretch of the bridge where it's at its highest. Currently, small mechanic shops line this street and repair work takes place on the pavements, disrupting pedestrian flow. The undercroft is being used to store, down broken, to store broken down vehicles and parts, as well as waste and rubble. The central part of the road will instead be programmed to facilitate a portion of the repair work, returning the pavement to pedestrians. A pit lane style arrangement on the road allows vehicles in need of repair to pull in for servicing. A second level is added to the undercroft space to facilitate this repair area which will house waiting rooms, office space, workshops, storage, etc. Access to this upper level is via two staircases and a central goods lift. Steel columns support the second level, which has the added benefit of ensuring that the workspace on the ground floor remains in shade. The railing and divisions of the second floor vary in height and transparency depending on the program. This proposal, while more expensive than difficult, does more than just serve as a mechanic. The reorganization of the street section would bring life back to the pavements and make them easier to maintain. The pit lanes would provide more adequate space for repair work and maintenance, particularly with the tools, parts and workshops situated directly above. And so in conclusion, this project is addressing a growing problem within Karachi, the issue of land ownership and eviction in the context of an ever densifying city. With the anti-encroachment drive on the forefront of tension, this project aims to mediate and provide solutions. This is done by setting a framework to allow for capitalizing on opportunity while benefiting the public. The case studies show how detrimental the effects can be without cooperation and how successful they can be with it. Taking time to understand specific contexts, both physically and culturally, is crucial in order to respond with sensitivity. To spend time on site, observing and reflecting was the most important part of this process. Understanding feasibility of construction in terms of site constraints, costs and materials helps to keep this project grounded, realistic and achievable. The three proposals vary in terms of their cost to show the potential that can be achieved with or without a large budget. This project is an example which can then be used across different parts of the city. The approach and the strategy are replicable, but responding to specific sites and needs in terms of the program and the built form makes every proposal unique. It's a reactionary project responding to built forms and use of space that currently exists. But ultimately, this project seeks to open a discussion about how we should be anticipating the urban voids that are created the next time the infrastructure is planned. Thank you. So oh, that's fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, so wonderful to have uh, a very different uh, perspective on so many of the things we do. I'm, I'm interested actually, I should have said in the introduction that Saha is an architect working at Night Architects, or has been. And, um, uh, you, you know, I think this immediately kind of throws a new light, a sort of an architect's thinking light, I suppose, on, on some of the things we do. Um, a question for you, to, to what extent is this a sponsored uh, study uh, by the city authorities or whoever it is who, who sort of operates this, this neck of the woods in, in Karachi? Or, or is this your own initiative that you're just doing it out of interest? This is my own. So this was a thesis project for my final semester at university. So currently it's completely self-driven, but I hope that one day I can get the people in Karachi involved in it and actually make it happen. So that was my question is, I mean, have you, have you shown it to any city authorities or sort of tried to see how they might react? Not yet. Um, I spoke with some of the landowners for some of the case studies we looked at back in January when I was doing the research for this project. Um, and my intention is to take it back and see what they think. Because, uh, you know, it clearly is a, a wonderful um, approach to transforming what, I mean, many of us have seen such 
such places in cities like Karachi around the world. Um, uh, it's, it'd be wonderful. We'll come to other questions in a minute. So, so let's see. We've got some questions on on the screen. Um, uh, yes, I mean, let's, uh, one, a very practical one. First of all, noise. How noisy is the space? This is from Clotilde Robin, um, from uh, space underneath the the bridges. Um, uh, and uh, have you thought about how, which activities could happen in such places in a country such as the UK? Similar to another question. Mm. Um. Yes, so the space in Karachi that I'm looking at is very noisy. That road is quite busy and lively and active. There's a lot of traffic and there's a lot of foot traffic as well. Um, one of the advantages of this particular site is that it's for a piece of public transport that hasn't currently opened. So I'm hopeful that when this bus route opens, the traffic on this road would decrease and that would help with the noise solution. Um, and then, of course, like adding planting and things like that helps to try and screen it out a little bit. Um, but also it's common to have this sort of level of background noise all across the city. So residents of Karachi are a lot more used to it than we are here in the UK. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. And I think here in the UK, a lot of the spaces under bridges here have been used for things like shops and pubs and cafes and stuff like that, which are wonderful. But you're then able to sort of close them off completely from the street. Um, and the thing I found interesting with this project is that they're not buildings under these structures, they are spaces. They're open, they're visible, and they're sort of a lot more, there's no boundary between this space and the street, um, which I think is quite often created here. I think a lot of that is to do purely with climate. Um, Karachi is quite warm all year round. The winter is very pleasant and the summer is hot, which is why the shade comes in handy. Um, but as for these sorts of projects in the UK, I think that the winter here makes it a lot harder to do something but this fluid. And I think safety is a major factor, isn't it? I mean, clearly, if you are actually going to promote any kind of activity, even if it be just, um, you know, parking your horse uh, under, a, under a flyover, uh, where you've got to get in and out of it from live traffic, um, mm. clearly that's an issue. Now, I know, again, in the context of somewhere like Karachi, that kind of happens <laughs> quite astonishingly. Um, but uh, in the UK, I would imagine this could be a very difficult thing to to get the authorities to agree to, let alone people to, to mm. do. What do you reckon about that? Yeah, that's true. I mean, in Karachi, I think with these sites, as proven from the research, those things are going to happen whether you help them or not. So with this project in particular, it was about how can you make that process safer? So with the animal one, I looked into how to create access ramps on either side of the structure so that you don't have to sort of drag an animal across the road and into the space. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas here, yes, the, the sort of rules and safety and things like that would create a bit of a barrier, but I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. Those rules are there for a reason um, and society sort of functions very differently here. Um, I yes. think it would require an entirely different approach looking at a site in the context of London, for example, than it would in Karachi. Clearly, um, and, and, and you know, the context is, is completely different. Um, but I, I really like the way that you, you you kind of did your three your Venn diagram, your you know people, animals, and vehicles, and sort of just looked and see how a space is going to be used and identified the the kind of key three um, priorities, uh, which was going to be good for all of them. How, how might you uh, imagine sort of extending that thinking into let's say a London flyover if you were going to be working out how you're going to design a new flyover and make the best of the use of the space under it. What might be the equivalent parts of the Venn diagram, do you think? Well, so the sort of range that you get on the streets here might be quite different. You may not see goats and cows on the streets of London, but I think yeah. that <laughs> the reason that all of that came into that is just because I went to this site every day for two weeks with my dad and we sat there and we watched it um, and we made note of things that happened and took pictures and talked to people. And so I think the process was more important than sort of the outcome in a way. So the same thing of rather than looking at a map and sketching over it to actually go there and sit and watch and see how people interact with the space. That is critical. Is where it? I would start. Yeah, that really is critical. And actually, it's worthwhile just pausing on that thought for a moment, because, um, you know, so often you're, you're right. We take Google and we look at the map and we, we, we sort of draw over it kind of thing um, without ever having to be to the site. I mean, obviously, we always like to go to a site if we possibly can, but sometimes it's not possible. And even if it is, 
um, maybe our program or our budget doesn't allow us to do what you've done, which is to sit there for two weeks and actually really absorb the issues that uh, influence that, the use of that site. So, um, you know, that is a lesson that we, we can and, and, and should learn, um, particularly those of us designing bridges, because what we do with our bridges and flyovers is to make a radical change to uh, environments. And we got some more questions in here. Um, there was a question here about um, fire and vandalism from James Parsons. Um, obviously, there's a risk from uncontrolled use. But again, as you point out, I suppose maybe that's a risk that is more familiar to people in Karachi than, than we would accept here. Yes, and I think that sort of the vandalism and the risks associated with the use of this space would happen with or without these interventions. And if you give something to people that they can use and that benefits them, they would have less incentive to, to mess with it and instead would actually hopefully want to use it to its appropriate use. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. Um, <clears throat> and we've seen this before, haven't we, where, where a local community takes a project to heart as their, as their project, they like it. Um, they're much less likely to vandalize it, put graffiti all over it and all that sort of stuff. That's something which I think we've got a lot of evidence for. Whereas if something is, is already messy or unpleasant, uh, it's much more likely to, to suffer the, that kind of vandalism. Um, exactly. <clears throat> also in the proposal that I have for people, I've actually created a wall at the back here that's open to be vandalized. Painters oh, make a mural on it, um, have some fun with it. You know, the yeah. sort of level of craftsmanship in Pakistan is beautiful. And yeah. if somebody yeah. can come along and paint some amazing truck art on it, yeah. why Love not? It. Really good. I think, Robert, your question uh, has been answered, I think, because local authorities have not yet seen those proposals. Um, and, but it would be very interesting to know how they, they go down. I kind of want you to come back and tell us in a year's time when you've had a chance to, to talk about these ideas with, with people in Karachi uh, and to see whether actually there might be a, an appetite, um, uh, and even more, a little budget to, uh, to actually do some of this because it would be um, really spectacular. Um, unless there's any more questions um, people are dying to ask, I think we'll probably move on. Well done, you've, you've kept us pretty well to time. There's just a question popped up there about um, using the railway arches, um, which of course we, we do know that's the, that's the sort of equivalent of using the arches under railway viaducts for, for small businesses and so on. Um, uh, that, that of course is something which we see already and have been for a long time and we must make better use of actually. And on that note, let us let us move on slightly ahead of time. So so uh, we move on to Nick McGough. So you have a few more minutes, Nick, you'll be pleased to know. Um, um, regeneration and placemaking under HS2. Now, I think this might be quite controversial. Um, I don't know, we'll see how we go. Uh, in the low carbon economy um, and in the post COVID economy, uh, there are already a lot of voices saying, you know, do we still need HS2? Um, we're not going to get into the need question because I think we're going to just talk about the um, uh, the, the fact that it's happening. Um, but Nick is uh, associate partner with Williamson and Partners and uh, is, is working and has been working on, on HS1 and HS2 uh, for Network Rail for, for some time. So come and talk to us, Nick, and uh, I'll shut up. Look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. Thank you, Ian. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Right, hopefully everyone can see that. Yes, that's looking good, thank you. <clears throat> Brilliant. Um, so building very much on what um, Saha was actually saying, this is a, a, a sort of uh, complementary uh, sort of whistle-stop tour through some of the work that um, I've personally been involved with um, at Western Williamson and Partners. Um, centered really around uh, what we believe in terms of cities working as a system of systems. Uh, and, 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 a, and a strong belief that high quality infrastructure can add to the well-being and happiness uh, of the denizens of urban areas. And I use the word denizens as opposed to citizens because it does include exactly, as Saha was saying, animals, wildlife, uh, and, and the biodiversity aspects that need to be included in, uh, in these sorts of linear infrastructure projects. Um, so infrastructure, um, a lot of it's not seen. This is a, this is a, a, a shot of one of our projects, the tunnels uh, leading into uh, Paddington Crossrail. Um, 
but they, but they have huge implications on, on what is seen. Uh, and, and here we see a, uh, an actual vent shaft um, just, on, uh, just next to Paddington Station. Um, and designing those so that there's a, there's a generosity of public space um, and that you work with the existing fabric of the city. And um, this is a shot inside uh, Paddington Station, actually one of the, sorry, Paddington Crossrail Station, uh, which I believe is the only Crossrail Station where you're able to see the sky uh, from, from the platforms and concourse below. Um, but getting to uh, the sort of the, the meat of this presentation, really, um, repurposing sort of existing rail viaducts. Um, and I'm going to talk about two things here. So uh, the existing, repurposing the existing uh, and the new, which, um, which Ian mentioned there. So starting with Fenchurch Street, um, which is a, a sort of hidden gem of a station right in the square mile on the eastern edge uh, of the city cluster, um, located uh, sort of a, just over a five minute walk from the, uh, the walkie talkie in the city of London, um, used by a huge number of commuters, but uh, much done loved. I think um, a grade two listed facade uh, is pretty much all that's left uh, of what was quite a dramatic um, station and train shed. Uh, that has uh, seen, I think, in the 1980s, uh, an oversight development, um, sort of, uh, I won't say delicately, um, placed above the station. Um, and really, we were commissioned by C2C. Um, and this is, again, a very interesting um, sort of change in how uh, the UK government and the, and the DFT are sort of seeing uh, the future of the railway um, in the UK, where they're wanting train operators um, and uh, potentially franchises to take more ownership of managing their own stations. Um, that's obviously all under review currently with the Williams Review and the white paper is out. Um, but in this particular case, we were commissioned by C2C um, to actually look, uh, look, look ahead and, and, and look at the next sort of 50 years of Fenshire Street. Um, I will say now, this is all uh, pre-COVID work that you're seeing. Um, so uh, the demand question, uh, the sort of, you know, demand and provide, which is something uh, which traditionally um, ha has been the operating model for, for the way that DFT fund projects, um, I think is probably something that will need to be re-looked at. But nevertheless, uh, providing a vision rather than just forecasting and providing based on that forecast is something that uh, need, uh, will, will certainly, uh, I think, be re-evaluated re in, the, in the coming sort of uh, months uh, and years. But essentially, the DFT wrote into very early on in C2C's franchise agreement uh, a committed obligation to do uh, a master plan to look ahead. Um, and that's something that we took on working very closely with stakeholders. I mean, any, any of these sorts of projects that I'm showing um, are uh, hugely collaborative, both in terms of uh, the interdisciplinary uh, way that we design as architects with uh, engineers and specialists, um, but also between all the relevant stakeholders, uh, in this case, whether it be, you know, City of London, uh, Tower Hamlets, uh, local landowners, neighbours, Network Rail, Transport for London, uh, Heritage Advisors, Historic England, uh, retailers, you know, the Tower of London, uh, Blackstone, you know, all, all sorts of uh, interested parties. Um, whose voices um, uh, sort of need to form part of that dialogue. Um, so the aims and, and objectives, as stated in that commitment, were around passenger experience, uh, providing access and legibility, um, safety and security and sustainability, obviously, that goes with that, um, and future-proofing uh, and looking at future growth. Um, and this was very much predicated around uh, the, sort of the housing demand uh, along C2C's line. Uh, which you can see here, um, sort of ending on the left at Fenchurch Street um, in, the, uh, in the square mile. Um, and what we very quickly realised is um, there's only so much that new signalling, longer trains, uh, uh, different timetables, etc., cetera, can, uh, can add in terms of capacity. Um, and that actually, if you if you looking at the demand, um, looking at a significant increase in demand, it's more platforms that you need. Um, and there's actually a site 350 metres um, to, uh, to the east of the current Fenchurch Street um, station. Um, the old, uh, or the current, in fact, Tower Gateway DLR station, um, which is going to be decommissioned as part of a rerouting into Bank, which provides a perfect opportunity to actually rethink this sort of eastern fringe um, of, of the city. 
Um, now with any of these projects, um, sort of wholesale change is always a challenge. And so there are questions of deliverability, phasing, how you'd go about doing something like this. This is very much, a, you know, this is a project of decades, not years. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, it may well happen uh, in a number of uh, in a number of phased um, sort of iterations. And here we're showing an option where, you know, potentially you actually augment the station. You split the station into two, um, and you know, very much um, sort of playing on themes at the beginning of this conference around reuse and repurposing. Uh, the, the, the former DLR station and making that part of Fenchurch Street Station being our, our sort of option A uh, or option B here at the bottom saying well actually why not move the whole station and this then leads into the conversation uh, around well what do you do with that existing viaduct um, and we looked at um, sort of a number of precedents um, I think some of which we've seen uh, this morning there in, in King's Cross around uh, public spaces, uh, how to activate uh, and make best use of, uh, of places around, uh, around transport hubs. Um, I won't talk too much about these um, because I think uh, we'll, we'll sort of, um, uh, I'll probably have quite a bit more to say about uh, HS2, but I think in terms of uh, you know, the placemaking opportunities to create something like, um, for, for anyone that's been to the New York High Line, uh, which was in the old meatpacking district of the city and, uh, and an old disused um, industrial uh, railway line that's been turned into uh, an incredible public amenity, um, a high level greened walkway um, that has, has had incredible success and led to uh, the development of Hudson Yards uh, at, at the end of that, um, uh, that linear park uh, as it's now become. Uh, another development opportunity as we've seen in London, you know, Europe's tallest I think it's Europe's, that is still Europe's tallest skyscraper, the Shard. Um, actually, you know, people forget the Shard actually ploughs straight through London Bridge Station. Um, it is actually, uh, you know, uh, a sort of extreme oversight development. Um, and then, you know, on, on the right, the repurposing of uh, old train sheds. Um, I've got an example here of uh, uh, a train, uh, an old train shed in, in Paris converted into the, um, the Orsay Museum. Uh, there's another great example, I've not got an image here, of uh, Odocha Station in Madrid, uh, where part of the train shed is actually used as a botanic garden, sort of complete with, uh, complete with terrapins. Um, and then ground, ground floor activation, and this is really uh, key in terms of how we design uh, or repurpose or adapt our existing infrastructure and making sure that what are large linear infrastructure projects don't cause the sort of severance issues um, that I think many cities in the UK and, and, and probably around the world have suffered from. Um, and I'll end on uh, this Fenchurch Street piece with uh, a sort of high level visioning piece we've looked at in terms of what that might mean, the sort of the three layers. Um, so I think um, in the previous uh, presentation we heard about the importance to be realistic about uh, sort of private investment um, and the commercial opportunities uh, that lie along some of these routes. Um, obviously, being on the eastern fringe of the city of London, uh, where land value uh, sort of traditionally has been incredibly high, um, you could foresee something like um, the Hudson Yards development in, in, in New York on, uh, around, uh, around this sort of area, but not forgetting uh, the contribution that a project like this can make to the urban realm below um, and the permeability um, and pedestrian and cycling experience, which has really been brought into focus with um, uh, what we're going through in terms of global lockdown. Um, so having talked about the repurposing of existing uh, viaducts, I'm now going to speak a little bit about new uh, rail corridors um, and starting with uh, the HS2 map. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see my, my cursor here as I, as I sort of circle. Yeah, brilliant. Um, uh, and the HS2 map, uh, which, which many people uh, are likely to be familiar with, I'd imagine, but which runs from, uh, from London Euston uh, through Old Oak, uh, which is a, a huge sort of regeneration site, um, then through Birmingham Interchange, uh, into Birmingham uh, Curzon Street, uh, and then up uh, through the two arms of the Y, uh, ultimately to Leeds and to Manchester. Um, the, the, the portion that we're involved with um, as Western Williamson and Partners um, is the, what's called the N1, N2, uh, portion here, uh, which is essentially from uh, from about uh, Long Itchington Wood, the tunnel that starts uh, around this sort of location, um, and the 90 kilometres that track up through uh, Birmingham Interchange, the triangle here known as the Delta, um, that then spurs into uh, Curzon Street Station. 
Um, but before I speak about HS2, um, there's the obvious, uh, you know, naming, I mean, the clue is in the name, it's the second high speed line in the country. There is uh, an HS1 line. Um, and again, uh, it's worth pointing out here that HS2 and HS1 were at one point going to be linked. Um, you can see there that they get within 700 meters of each other, um, but for various reasons, which I won't go into now, uh, don't connect. Um, and so this was, a, this was a piece of work, a speculative piece of work we did together with our collaborators, Expedition Engineering. Um, looking at uh, how you might, again, repurpose existing infrastructure. So you can see here this long and straight um, portion of rail uh, is, was used for the Eurostars coming into, um, coming into Waterloo Station before they were moved to St Pancras, uh, and is now massively under, underutilised and could very, very easily be upgraded to a high-speed line. It's straight, it's flat, um, eminently feasible. Um, and then actually to take that through and connect in uh, Gatwick, Heathrow, um, and then plug into HS2 um, seems like uh, a, a, a sort of an integrated approach that's necessary. Uh, and I think one that as a, as a country, I mean, things have changed now. We've got the, the National Infrastructure Commission, which is fairly recent. Um, and that commission has a much broader remit than some of the more um, sort of uh, siloed agencies we've had in the past. But having said that, the National Infrastructure Commission is separate to the Airports Commission. Um, and you do start thinking, you know, really, we should be thinking of infrastructure in a joined up way. Why, are our, why is energy and transport not actually brought together? You know, there, there, there are certainly advantages that that, that could bring. Um, but I won't dwell, I won't dwell on uh, this one. Um, uh, the, I mean, the press got very excited about this idea um, uh, and uh, the DFT actually contacted, contacted um, us directly and asked us to submit it as part of the uh, uh, open rail uh, market led proposals, um, which we did. Uh, and we got a, a letter back from the DFT uh, about eight months later, three, three sides of A4 explaining that while it was a brilliant idea, it was all a bit too difficult. Um, so. You know, hopefully the door's not entirely closed on this one, but we will we will see. Um, and then moving on to um, HS2 uh, phase one, uh, Erin North, 90 kilometres into central Birmingham. Thank you very much. Um, gosh, interesting stuff. Uh, please do start putting your questions on the Q&A. There's probably lots of things going through your mind. Um, I, I just to sort of kick things off, I mean, I, you know, I can't help thinking, and I just sort of stand back a little bit from, from the technical details which you've talked about and so on, I uh, can't help thinking that um, there's going to be a big question mark over HS2 uh, in a kind of post-COVID sort of environment. Um, and and Clotilde has also raised this sort of question uh, about whether you've been having to rethink anything already. Um, is there a, is there a, conversation going on about a, a rethink of some of this because of the possibility that we won't be traveling so much? Uh, th th there is absolutely um, and I, I will say now that some of this uh, is, is confidential um, but uh, the, the HS2 are currently putting a paper together um, which is going to the government about how it can help to prioritize um, cycling uh, within, within its route and how it can go beyond just being the railway. Um, and that is that is uh, that's um, gone in, I think, or about to go in recently. Um, uh, but in terms of the mandate to build phase one, uh, that's obviously there. Um, Boris was uh, at our site uh, this week, saying uh, how uh, necessary the project is. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's it's unlikely phase one uh, will um, change significantly in scope. Uh, as a railway. I mean, um, it's a real challenge, isn't it, for projects like this? Because as you said it yourself, and actually you were talking about the Penchat Street project, projects yeah. take decades. It's a project of decades, not years. Yeah. You know, whenever you're planning anything like this, and we know, I mean, how long have we been talking about Crossrail? How, how long have we been talking yeah. about any of these things? You, you know, it, it is decades away. And, and none of us has that kind of a crystal ball. Um, we can assume that growth will continue um, the way it has been. Um, but you know, then along comes something like COVID, or actually, um, perhaps even oh yes, certainly more significant. You know, we are now much more aware of the impact of our efforts on the planet. Um, you know, uh, a, a year ago, or, or more than a year ago, perhaps you might not have been thinking too much about the the, the carbon in that uh, extraordinary um, 
uh, endeavor but i mean you know I, I if we were if we were really meaning business and doing a zero carbon development to improve rail traffic and rail transport in the uk it wouldn't look like that would it it's it, well there are more there are people much more qualified than me that would be able to answer um, those sorts of questions in in detail with uh, sort of sound um, statistical and scientific backing. I think that the message that HS2 is um, is sort of trying to get across, and I and I don't you know I, I don't want to uh, sort of speak uh, on their behalf. I speak no, no, from, I understand. My, from my own from my own perspective, but is is the three C's. So it's capacity, connectivity, and carbon. Uh, and HS2 are very conscious that actually they need to be part of the solution. Uh, and part of our move towards uh, net zero carbon, um, and that that uh, you know requires a step change in, in in transport. I mean, there's a bigger question about will we travel as much post COVID. I mean, I, and, and no one has the answer to that right now. Uh, but certainly, in terms of as we've seen in high speed rail in, in continental Europe and how that's affected uh, domestic uh, air travel. And if a project like HS for Air were to go ahead, where you actually link HS2 to HS1, um, and actually, you know, by extension, HS2 then becomes part of the European uh, high-speed rail network, um, then it's it's actually fundamentally moving away from air travel for yes. much shorter journeys, um, yep. and that's that's got to be positive from a sustainability and, and environmental front. Yeah, no, there's no question. There, there, there is certainly um, a, a desire now, a, a, again, uh, you know, the move away from aviation is inevitable, um, I think, in, in, the post, in the zero carbon economy. Um, and um, uh, just as an aside, while I wait for more of you to ask some questions, um, uh, we just had, I absolutely just had a couple of days debating the carbon um, issue in the Henderson Colloquium. Um, uh, which was a very inspiring few days. In fact, I can see some of the participants in that were actually with us today as well, which is which is really good. Um, but you know, the, the realization it, it, dawning perhaps rather too slowly on most of us. Um, uh, the, you know, we have to start thinking radically. You know, no aviation, no cement. You know, it's there's no kind of grey area in between. It's absolutely binary. It's not. Uh, you know, it's it's something that we've really got to be mindful of. And so uh, I don't know. Have you talking about that? I mean, looking at the viaducts themselves, um, you know, lots of concrete structure there. Um, uh, any alternatives being considered? Um, there's actually some really interesting uh, innovation work which HS2 are doing, um, uh, specifically around um, how. Uh, and I will, uh, given that I mean, I'm guessing the audience uh, is is probably uh, more uh, expert in engineering than I am. Um, are looking at the the, the utilisation of rebar within uh, viaducts and uh, well concrete structures uh, more more generally, um, and whether that can be pushed through a data driven approach in terms of how rebar actually performs, um, and how reinforced concrete actually performs, so that we go beyond utilising uh, sort of standard BSEN uh, or Euro codes, and actually uh, look at um, you know, utilizing the structure in an even more optimizing way and therefore reduce the amount of concrete. And that is work that's happening. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's, that's interesting. I mean, there is a lot out there now and more and more um, people are writing about uh, new materials and new ways of using old materials and, and that sort of stuff. And we've all got to be mindful of that. Every one of us on this call, on this, on this conference needs to be mindful of, of that in terms of how do we um, build for the future uh, a, a, a more... Uh, sustainable uh, future because it really um, otherwise it's 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 a problem i'm going to invite the other um uh, yes ian this is paulo i have a question for nick oh. if i if i may um, and first of all great great presentation really enjoyed it uh, being a bridge person myself and um, on the uh by the, the approach by to the birmingham station um there was one proposal was to have of course the viaduct supporting the, the line and then kind of retrofitting some buildings in the public realms below it. Yeah. As a, a more kind of radical solution whereby you don't have viaducts but you construct actual buildings where you can provide facilities, buildings which would have uh, the lines effectively supporting a, a roof level. Uh, something like that would be more radical being considered? Um. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure all kinds of solutions have been considered in the in the sort of ten years that HS2 has been sort of incubating. 
um, the, the reality of the, of the Act, the powers of the Act, um, which allow HS2 to be built and what has parliamentary consent, um, very much limit HS2 to uh, working within the limits of deviation and providing the structures that have been illustrated or examples of which have been illustrated in the parliamentary bill. Um, and it's about building a railway. So while, you're, while we're building a big linear infrastructure project and you think, well, actually, why not put, you know, a fiber optic spine in with there or, or a kind of, you know, um, the act only allows you to build the railway and, and things uh, underneath uh, would be uh, in collaboration and partnership with local landowners, uh, local city councils, and therefore can't be relied upon um, to hold up the railway. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that directly answers your question, but it's, it's it, I, I, th I think you're, um, you're absolutely right, um, but unfortunately, the, the way the legislation works does make it challenging to be a bit more radical with these things. Yeah, thank you. So, um, thank you for that question, Paolo. Um, I'm going to invite the other two speakers from this morning, uh, Stephen and Saha, to, to turn your microphones and cameras back on. Um, and um, please uh, open up the dialogue uh, both between the three of you uh, and also um, from anybody to ask any questions for our three speakers. Um, so uh, who wants to, to go first? There is a question here from, from Jeffrey Haynes on the, on the Q&A here about using the spaces underneath the viaducts uh, for new buildings. Was there um, an idea of constructing buildings and other structures underneath the viaducts seen as viable? That's one for you, presumably, Nick. <clears throat> um, well, one, one for both ourselves and, and, and Saha, I guess. But um, yeah, of I mean, for, for, from, the, from the sort of um, uh, HS2 perspective, it, it, it's, um, there's a couple of things. So one is you've obviously got to maintain uh, the structure. So that means you need access to the bearings. So if you're building a building underneath, uh, it can't interface. So it's gonna, have a, it's gonna have a lid, it's gonna have a roof on it that isn't going to touch the soffit. Um, and there will need to be, you're either in between the piers, in which case uh, you're, you know, it's relatively straightforward, or you're fully around the piers and therefore there needs to be uh, agreements put in place so that HS2 can at any point uh, inspect, maintain, uh, replace uh, those bridge bearings. And there's obviously the, the, the added complication of any foundations for those buildings and how that could potentially interact with the foundations of the piers. Um, but it's been looked at. It's all eminently possible. Um, you know, we're we're looking at significant spans here, um, and uh, a significant structure. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, obviously, we are talking about uh, carbon a lot, and I think we should be, and, and it ought to be kind of number one. And Clotilde has raised the question about doing the calculations. Um, is there actually a carbon calculation on, done on these projects now? I mean, it may not have been done when you first did it, but uh, somebody ought to be doing this now as a, as a matter of um, course, particularly because the companies represented have all signed that declaration that was referred to earlier. Yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll just come in on to that. So we're, we're doing quite a lot on this, and I know that other organisations are as well, and we, we're developing our own uh, carbon calculator tool um, because it is really important just to fully understand the, the, the quantities of carbon that are involved with the, the sort of schemes that we design. And you're right, it's, it's something that maybe wasn't as high up on the agenda, but it really is right at the top now. And, and that's something that on a lot of new projects that I'm finding is that that is an important consideration. It, it's got to be number one, um, absolutely. What about you, Nick? Is that something which, uh, I mean, it's, it's perhaps more in the engineer's domain, but uh, is it something which you guys are uh, alert to? Uh, definitely alert to absolutely. We've signed. Um, we've signed three. We've signed architecture declares. We've signed uh, academics declare, and we've signed construction construction declares. The signing, so we've, the we've, signing's we've, the easy bit, isn't it? We've, we've declared we, exactly. We've declared a lot uh, in terms of what we're doing. We're um, we're currently looking at uh, bringing on board uh, expertise um, uh, in house uh, full time to look at this because uh, at the moment, I mean, we're we're a, we're a you know, we're an SME, we're a, we're a studio of uh, 100 architects in central London. Um, we're not uh, a, a global multidisciplinary international um, engineering firm with, with, with those sorts of resources. Um, but we're taking it very seriously. Uh, we collaborate with uh, those that do have that expertise. Um, and on the HS2 project, we've been working very um, uh, closely with our engineering partners, looking at developing the new BRIAM infrastructure standard uh, as part of HS2. 
um, and uh, contributing to the overall um, uh, analysis uh, of the whole project and our patch within it. Yeah. So how how is how is this uh, area of uh, interest affecting you and your work? Do you think? Um, I'm not sure at the moment. I haven't had much exposure to it, but it's definitely something that's very important to me. Um, particularly, I think in Karachi, it's massively important. The climate change on a global scale is affecting Karachi and Pakistan a lot worse than it is in other areas. It, is it? Um, would you say it's a, a kind of on, on on everybody's lips there as much as it is here in terms of the sort of number one agenda? I don't think it is, but I think it needs to be. Um, Although in recent, I mean, I'm not sure how much of this was on the news here, but there were there was severe flooding there a few weeks ago from monsoon yeah. rains, and it's the worst they've had in years. And yeah. I think a lot of that comes into it and shows how critical it is there. I mean, it becomes life and death a lot sooner there than yeah. it has yeah. here. Um, so it's definitely something that I think is massively important. I just am not, um, I'm not as well versed in it as I should be or want to be. No, sure. Well, I think we all need to to up our game in that area. Um, as I said, Nick, I mean, sorry, slightly, slightly cruelly, but um, you know, signing those declarations is the easy bit. I was one of the first to sign the structural engineers declare, um, but actually doing it is another. And and and, you know, we've been so um, sort of brought up and 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 taught to to think of safety, for example, in the engineers' world. Safety is our kind of number one agenda. Um, you know, the carbon thing has to be right up there alongside it, and certainly the institution of structural engineers and other bodies are are making a, a big deal out of making the carbon calculation. We've got to measure what we do. If we don't measure what we do, we can't show that we're reducing it. And we've got to get not just reduced reductions, but to zero. I'm going to bring in uh, a question which was for, for you, Steve, earlier on, actually, from Alistair Hughes. Um, so I think probably triggered by your the, the, the work you did with those rather lovely uh, sheds where you'd sort of stripped the roof off and uh, and, and made a curly canopy and, and, and so on. So the question is, given new walls and presumably new glazing as well, would anybody's code of conservation ethics have been violated by a decision to lift off the timber roof framing, refurbish it in the workshop and lift it back onto the replacement walls? So um, using your old materials, please, how, how do yeah. you do that better? Well, okay, I guess just answer, that, that was a very specific question for, um, it was the chemistry building at on the Newton and Arkwright project. And, is is right. It's a valid comment about the the code of conservation and conservation ethics because it is a, a really important consideration. But it's not it's not black and white. So the the, the sort of conservation uh, the approach towards conservation is where you have a listed building or a protected building. It's you know it's a, it's a heritage building, and each has to be considered on its own merits. Um, you know, the, the approach is always to try and preserve as much as possible, preserve as found, retain as much of the existing historic fabric as possible, because that is part of the history. And, and that is always the starting point. But if you have a building, a structure, you know, a bridge, if it's in a, it's in a really bad condition, if it's in a really poor state and there is a risk that it might not be reused, and just could continue to fall into disrepair, then it does need some quite major works carried out. And you, know, there's, you have to kind of weigh both factors up because there's one approach where you retain it, but you don't do any work to it and it continues to kind of um, degrade and it will fall away from history and will be lost. Or we can do something to, um, to try and retain it and enhance it and mean that it will be used. Because that's the key thing is if, if a building or a bridge, if it's used, it will be maintained and then it will, it, you know, it will be, its life will be preserved. And in that case, and I, you know, I could talk about this for a long time, it's a really big topic and of discussion, but it's, you know, what was more important was to ensure that it was going to be occupied, it was going to be reused, and it would have another 100, 200 years of life, rather than it being, uh, you know, no, no modifications, retaining, you know, you're conserving it as found, but it's not used and it will just fall into disrepair. And I think <clears throat> we do need to take that approach for all of our historic structures, you know, because you can, even with bridges, you know, you can have some, some structures that are in a really poor state, but you need to do something radical and it may be perceived as being quite a, a bold and uh, not in keeping with the sort of conservation philosophy. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a fair point. 
Um, there's always a balance, isn't there? Um, incidentally, I'm noticing on something I forgot to say right at the beginning on the Q&A thing. Uh, I've forgotten all about the little thumbs up. You can see when you look at the Q&A list, there's a little thumb up thing, which I think the idea is if there was a lot of questions, if you like one, just click the thumb. And if lots of people like a question, it comes to the top of the list. So um, it helps me to see what everybody wants to ask. Satish, wonderful to see you there. Satish Desai, um, who uh, is asking about impact disturbance to existing households. I'm not sure. I imagine this might be about HS2. Um, but everything we do uh, it has, has impact um, and, um, you know, of all sorts. Uh, who would like to, does anybody want to make a comment on how we can um, make sure that that is a, a major part of our thinking right at the very beginning, the planning stage of our projects? Nick saw his microphone off, so he's, uh, he's trying to hide under that one, but go on, I've got to give it yeah, to you. Yeah, I was just going to duck, duck off the screen. <laughs> um, I, I, th I think, you know, we have in this country actually quite a, a rigorous process for this. Um, and that's why the, the, the Act, the Parliamentary Bill for HS2 took so many years. That's why, uh, you know, Terminal 5 took over a decade. That's why, uh, you know, Heathrow expansion has actually, uh, you know, not gone ahead, you know. So, so I think, um, and I guess, you know, one, one point of reference, just sort of anecdotally, uh, which was reported in the, uh, in the papers, of, I think a good few months ago, uh, the Chinese wrote a letter um, to the chairman of HS2 and said, we'll build it in three years at one third of the cost. And you do wonder how that uh, would have played out in terms of considering uh, and being a good neighbor uh, and the impact on local communities, both uh, in planning and design, during construction, and then finally in operation uh, and legacy looking forward. We're designing for 120 years and, and the structures will very, very likely be there. Mm. Um, sort of longer than that. Um, so what, what I would say is actually what we, what, we, what we don't do so well, I think two things we don't do so well. Um, one is uh, sort of the joined up thinking and we've, we've talked about all that already so I won't, I won't dwell on that. Um, but the second one is looking at um, sort of business case and how projects are evaluated in terms of what they contribute sort of nationally. Um, because often it's about uh, journey times, you know, every second off a journey, when actually the, the, the contribution a project can make to a local community, and you saw in, in, in my last slide there, um, things, you know, as uh, sort of uh, simple, really, as, you know, allotments or community orchards, something that could bring some otherwise derelict land back, back into use for something uh, that, that, that can contribute to the communities can be of huge benefit. And that's not necessarily captured in the DFT's Green Book assessment of, uh, of linear infrastructure. Fair enough. <clears throat> I, I mean, Satish has, has added a, 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 subs, a, a subsidiary question about the, actually it's the sort of the other um, knock-on effect of something like HS, HS2 or, 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 you know, the planning refurbishment extra infrastructure, which would, would, would come as a result of, of projects like that. You know, these things need, need, need to happen and they will happen inevitably. Um, and we often can't predict how they're going to happen. Uh, this is one of the big challenges of, of, of this kind of major in, uh, intervention. And as you, are, you yourself say, it's 120 years design life, who knows what's going to happen there. Um, <clears throat> there's also a question here about Friendship Street, um, you know, just a, as, as an aside really, I think perhaps from Matthew, moving the, the, the station further from the city means it's less useful, um, I guess, but of course as we, as we know the city grows as well and so the city will move uh, towards it so I think it's a you know you move, move the station out a bit and then the city will move towards it whether that's good or bad is uh, another question um, just at the top of the list there um, we've talked about COVID a little bit but I think it might be quite good in the last few minutes of this uh, this session to just to, to, to reflect on on COVID and, and how COVID is is affecting our lifestyles we're all sitting at home probably um, some may be in the office, but we're, 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 we're living in a completely different way to the way we lived six months ago. Um, and the question is, how has it made you rethink the projects? I mean, these projects have, have happened over a long period of time and they started well before COVID. But have you now in the, in the last six months had to rethink what you're doing uh, in terms of, you know, the numbers of people flowing through stations and, and gathering under viaducts and so on? Uh, perhaps, Steve, I'm going to put, put this to you and your questions because it also affects the building structures you've been working on, perhaps. Yeah, I think I think it's it's still early days, um, and but, but it is it is an important consideration. I mean, one of the things that we've been doing at Arup is 
is looking at people flows. And I, I've been involved with um, on HS2 working on interchange station. Um, and what what we were doing as part of pre-COVID is looking at people flows, you know, you know, um, mass motion, looking at how you know, using statistics and, and looking at exactly where people move to in the case of say a, an explosion or a you know an, a, an event. Um, and what, what we've actually done recently is adapted the software um, to kind of you know, maintaining social distancing and then looking at what impact that has on, for example, the station. You know, so if you're if you're having to maintain two meter distance between people, um, do you end up finding that there are pinch points? There are um, areas that are you know there's overcrowding um, and where where we would need to adapt the designs. And I think that's that's it's still in its early days. And you know whether it's two meters, whether it's a meter. There's, there's a whole load of considerations that will evolve and develop. And I think it's just something that we have to be able to adapt our designs to reflect that because, you know, at the start of the pandemic, it was two meters and we, we couldn't just, we couldn't radically change all of our designs. You know, if you design a building, you can't introduce additional exits and entrances, um, you know, more wider corridor spaces. And I think we just, we have but to be mindful. You can. It just depends at what stage that change yeah. has to happen. <laughs> yeah. No. Exactly. Saha, I mean, I know it's not specifically directly relevant, perhaps, to that study you did, but uh, would you like to comment on this this challenge we have uh, facing us? Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing that I was thinking about while well, I started this project in January, so just before COVID started, and then working on projects designing spaces where you want people to meet and interact while you're sitting locked at home being told not to meet and interact yeah. is a really <laughs> weird situation to be in. But it's also, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we're all hopeful for a vaccine and a solution that will allow us to go and socialize again. And it's, I find it very difficult to understand how many radical changes should be made to the way we design spaces based on something that we all hope is short term. Um, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting this afternoon, not this afternoon, in the second session uh, after the break, uh, we're going to be uh, hearing about some designs for footbridges, designed specifically for social distancing. Who knows whether we're going to need to have to do that. Uh, obviously, if a vaccine comes along, things may change. Nick, do you want to just add your tuppence worth on this topic? I, yeah, I would just echo exactly what Saha has just said. I, I think um, we've got to be careful here not to suddenly decide, right, we need to design for two meter social distancing for projects that are being designed for the next 120 years. Mm. Um, yeah. And, you know, while, while we're all living through this um, because we're having to, I think we can be actually quite selective about the positive changes this can bring. I think new attitudes to uh, working patterns, commuting, uh, flexible hours, um, you know, working from home, which we're all doing now, um, but also public spaces. I mean, my sort of local parks have actually been much busier than they have been uh, in, in, in sort of previous, uh, previous years. And I think, you know, there's a new sense of um, sort of civic pride and the, and the idea that green space, uh, pedestrian cycling, which has had yep. a massive uptake. Yep. Uh, so, so I think there's, there's positives we can take out of this. Absolutely. And we're valuing, and we need to. We're, we're valuing different things. I think, this, you, you know, we've, we've, we've all sort of stopped dead in our tracks and had to reevaluate things. Um, and, and that is having a fundamental effect, not only on our, on our own lives, as you say, whether we go to the park or not, use a bike, but actually also in the way we're designing and thinking about the future. Um, Matthew raises the very good point. I mean, if social distancing was going to have to continue, then the whole issue of public transport and public realm becomes a completely different one. Uh, you know, you, you'd have to agree, I suspect, that, um, you know, we would have to be fundamentally rethinking all these projects uh, if social distancing has had to be maintained. Um, very good. We're, we're getting towards the, the end of, of this first, uh, first session. Just, I'm actually, we'll, we'll come back to that, the thing. I'm just going to share my screen for a second because something was raised um, just a moment ago uh, about a, a document. So I don't know if you can see this, but this document came to my notice, uh, low embodied carbon in construction materials, what's stopping us? Uh, this is something which, um, and you're all seeing my emails as well, but um, uh, this is something which came to my mind uh, after the Henderson colloquium just a few days ago. 
Uh, it's a published, it's an Australian publication, but you can find it if you search for it, Low Embodied Carbon in Construction Materials. Uh, really worthwhile uh, having a look at that, really practical stuff in there. And the other thing to say is that um, the Institution of Structural Engineers, as you probably know already, uh, published a free download, downloadable document on how to calculate carbon in your structures. If you're not doing it already, you really must be doing it. And that's a really handy and, and very readable and applicable document, uh, which we should all have in the middle of our desks. Um, time for one more question. We've got one here. Why not let the Chinese build HS2 and use a huge amount of money saved on all the projects to benefit society? Well, there's a thought. Um, uh, more money available to compensate for the environmental impact too, rather than the usual somewhat token effort. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to allow you to answer that one, uh, but thank you, whoever you are uh, asking it uh, or making that point. Uh, quite interesting and, and thought provoking thought. We've got to our break time. Um, just checking Enya and the team, is there anything, does there anything need to be said? Any announcements needed at this point that I've forgotten? Yep, you've, you're doing perfect, Jan. Oh, well, that's good. I Nobody's ever told me that before. Um, you're my friend for life. Um, so we have a 15-minute break. Um, I suggest you just turn your microphones off. You can you know, leave, leave things otherwise as they are. Get yourself a coffee. I, thankfully, have already had one because I've got a wonderful wife who made me one half an hour ago. Um, but please uh, be back. Uh, ready to start again um, at uh, 10. Hold on, where are we? 10, 11, 10, 10 past 11. We'll see you again shortly. So people are coming back. I hope we've got a hundred people currently hooked up. There's a question from James Parsons just now, which I managed to dismiss before I answered it. Uh, so apologies for you, to you, James, uh, but you were asking the question about how many people were joining us, and uh, I think it was up to about 123 at one point. Um, we're currently just around about 100, uh, but this is good to have such a, a good uh, good turnout, as it were. Um, lovely to, to know that you're all um, hooked up wherever you are. So um, we're going to get uh, started again. I hope you all managed to have a cup of coffee or tea or whatever you had. And um, we're going to start shortly into our second session. But just before we do that, uh, an opportunity to talk about IAPC for a minute and um, just to plug a couple of events which you can see on your screen. Um, IAPC, as I said at the beginning, uh, International Association for Bridge and Structural Engineering, it's a bit of a mouthful, which is why we only ever say IAPC, um, uh, is uh, worldwide. We have, I can't remember now how many countries, 100 or so countries uh, represented uh, among our membership. Um, and I have to say, it's one of the organizations that I am um, most pleased to belong to and be part of. Um, it's a, a worldwide network of like-minded enthusiasts, I think is the best way of putting it, people who uh, work in and around the built environment um, and it's a fantastic opportunity for sharing knowledge and information and ideas um, to to uh, improve what we do the way we do things so I can warmly recommend it to you if you're not already a member maybe you're you may find that your organization is a member if you work for, for an AECOM or, or you know one of the companies that is a what we call a collective member then you uh, have um, uh, some way in, but it is very, very much better to be an individual member uh, if you can be. There are lots of benefits for young people. Um, looking down the list of participants, there's no uh, declaring uh, anything, of course, quite rightly about age. Um, I know that there are some names on there that, who would not, like me, qualify as being young <laughs> or not as young as we were, uh, but those who are under 35 in the uh, IABC family um, get all sorts of extra benefits. Um, and um, you can find out a lot about a lot of those by, by joining up. I do want to recommend to you that you go to our website. British Group is one of the national groups that has its own because we are actually one of the most active um, national groups. We do a lot of stuff. Um, and the more active you are, of course, the more visible you are. And uh, I'm, I like to say that uh, we're one of the more active and visible groups in the International um, Association. But do go to our website, IABAC. I -I dot org dot uk um, if you stop at the the dot org you end up at the headquarters which is based in zurich in switzerland um, and that'll tell you a lot about the international uh, activities but of course you can go to the, add, add the dot uk uh, and you'll see all that there as well and on the screen you can just see a couple of things that are coming up so um or internationally um, future design has has crossed the atlantic it did so a few years ago 
um, uh, and it's happening in New York City uh, on between the 15th and 29th of September. It's a slightly different format rather than the one day format that we have here. Um, but do check it out, fodnyc.org. You can see that on the screen. Um, you can join them just like they can join us. If there's anybody waking up in New York at the moment and joining us, you'll be most welcome. It must be an early breakfast if you are. Um, but uh, so that's number one. Um, that actually came as a result of Lee Frank, who uh, many of you will know, uh, really sort of started the future of design ball rolling many years ago um, and then moved to New York and, and did the same thing over there. So thanks to her for that. Now the COP Prize I mentioned briefly earlier on, uh, deadline for submission, yes, it is indeed October the 9th. You can find information there on our website. Uh, check it out, um, write a paper, and there'll be um, a judging of that paper and a prize, it's a, it's a, it's a good prize, uh, which will be awarded on November the 10th. And that's a date that doesn't appear on your screen, but it's worthwhile keeping an eye out for the Milne Medal. Every year we give the Milne Medal to an outstanding structural engineering designer, uh, somebody who really is a leader in their field uh, as an individual, not a company, an individual. Uh, it's very, very highly sought after. If you go to our website and look at the list of past recipients, you'll see that they are the, the, uh, the many of the, the sort of top-notch players, uh, the names that you'll be familiar with. So watch out for the Milne Medal on November the 10th, there'll be a lecture given. And in, con in conjunction with that, there'll be the Nethercott Prize. And Future Design in Manchester. Um, we do this Future Design event every year in London. We used to do, I mean, London, this is effectively, today is effectively the London event, even if you may be sitting in Timbuktu. Um, uh, and next year, subject to COVID, of course, uh, we'll either be live in Manchester or we'll be online like this. So again, watch this space, watch out for, for all of that. So again, enough from me. Um, I hope you're all back and ready to go. And Paolo, most importantly, that you're regular, re ready to go. Paolo per Perugini, I hope that got, I got that vaguely right, uh, who works for Arup um, in their Infrastructure London team. Um, he's going to talk to us about the London Luton Airport DART scheme. So, Paolo, over to you. Thank you, Ian. And I hope you can see my screen. I'm just trying to hide this. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, it's not. Okay. There we go. There we are. All, all good. Oh, good, good. Um, well, thank you. Thanks to you and thanks to Enea for, for, for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, the, the talk is about the London Luton Airport DART, uh, and DART uh, um, stands for Direct Air to Rail Transit, which is another bit of a mouthful of a, of a, of a title, but it actually explains quite well what this project is, is about. And I'll first give a bit of an introduction on, on on the background to the project and the drivers to it. And then I will have a run through the, the civil works um, that, that comprise the project. Uh, the context is that of uh, London Luther Airport, which has been for many years, one of the fastest growing airports in, in the UK. And uh, it, it, it's an airport that's been expanding and had a quite ambitious plan for future expansions as well. And it's also an airport that has a very good uh, uh, a rail link into central London. Uh, uh, you can get a train from St Pancras uh, to Luton Airport Parkway station uh, that takes you like 20 minutes and costs uh, approximately six pounds. So superior than all the other uh, London airports. Uh, but unfortunately, the last mile, or I better say the, the last two kilometers of that journey, currently um, uh, requires uh, catching a, a little shuttle bus. Um, and it's a shuttle bus that has been struggling to cope with the passengers' numbers, and uh, which was identified as uh, going to need even more support in the future. And uh, I think we need to be frank and say that L Luton Airport doesn't have a great reputation, and this was identified as one of the, the reasons uh, uh, why uh, of that. So what is the solution to that? I guess as an engineer, we need to uh, talk about solutions. The solution is, of course, the DART. And the DART is a, a, a two kilometer um, uh, people mover line. They would direct, I hope you can see my cursor, they would link the existing Neto rail station onto the airport terminal. And across these two kilometer journeys, um, we're hitting lots of different constraints, uh, uh, lots of different difficulties, which require a variety of structures that I will introduce to you shortly. And uh, 
but there's, there's two key drivers for this project. Um, the first of all, uh, the first one is what, what I mentioned earlier, the, the context of uh, increasing number of passengers. But the second one, I think most crucial one, especially in the context of the previous discussions that we had, is that currently, if you look at the, the, the model share in terms of how the people uh, get to the airport, and, and the chart on the right-hand side shows a comparison between all of the London airports, Luton ranks the worst in terms of number of passengers arriving um, to the airport by rail, despite it has a very good uh, railway link. And so the DART aims, you know, just for comparison, uh, Gatwick has more than doubled the, the, the share of passengers arriving uh, by train. And so the DART is really about uh, bumping up this number and getting up to the uh, Gatwick type of levels and removing people from uh, getting to the airport uh, through private cars and incentivize them to get uh, to use public transports and, and trains specifically. And Arup uh, was approached back in 2016 by LAL. LAL stands for London Luton Airport Limited, which is effectively the airport owner, which is a subsidiary of London uh, Luton Borough Council. And um, we were given what you see on the top right hand corner there, which is effectively a two pages brief, no more than that. And I hope that is blurry enough so you cannot read it. But um, one of those lines tells you that they wanted the DART to be open in 2021. So we had our work cut out there. Um, and we embarked on a very fast journey where we helped our client understand what they needed and what was the best solution for that. And then we breezed through concept design, costing, establishing a costing baseline, setting out the tender documentation, doing a scheme design, achieving full planning permission from two local authorities and persuading a number of major stakeholders. All of this in 14 months, um, you know, we, which is in the context of what we were discussing earlier, our project takes decades, uh, I think it's quite extraordinary. And a few months after, uh, the main civil wars contract, uh, in, which is, you know, contract value over 200 million pounds, was awarded uh, uh, to Volker Fitzpatrick here, I, I will refer them as VFK, uh, who appointed uh, as, uh, Tony GM Partners uh, as detailed design. Uh, you're going to see lots of uh, nice pictures of the construction and full credit goes to VFK, uh, who are doing a fanta fantastic job. I mean, we had it. Uh, quite a challenging job in doing this uh, very short time. They certainly have a, 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 a challenge to deliver the project in in just over four years. Early on in, in the in the concept phase, uh, we recognised that you know the, the the standard way of going about procuring this project was that of a uh, an overall uh, DMB contract uh, where you just let one single contract, uh, which uh, need to sort out uh, all of the key issues. But what we realized is that the, the, the people mover system um, uh, market is quite a, a niche one. And there's really just a handful of suppliers across the world, um, which means that there, was, there is little competition, especially if you restrict them to tie up with a, with a civil works uh, a contractor. So we wanted to achieve more value for money for our client. So we made a strategic decision to split uh, the, the, the contract in two separate contracts, one for the civil works, which is the one won by BFK, and a second one and separate one for the transport system, which was eventually won by Doppler Meyer. And we have been doing this, obviously we created a, a clear and crucial interface there, which we had to uh, partially resolve as part, as part of our scheme design. And the client had an aspiration of having a, a, a very high quality airport-like experience. So the, the vision for them was as soon as you step outside the net or rail realm, you already feel that you arrived at the airport terminal. And of course, our architects colleagues loved it because uh, that, you know, the, the objectives were not to have a, a, um, a simple kind of utilitarian, just functional infrastructure, but was to, to set the bar higher in terms of architectural quality. And for us, there was a bit of a concern whether that quality could be diluted through the design and build process. So what we did was to implement the so-called definition design procurement strategy, which uh, um, previously we really mostly applied to bridges project. I, I work on the New Champlain Bridge, for instance, where we apply this on the Queens Ferry Crossing, another one. 
And, and this means that we created a set of uh, drawings and documents that were embedded in the tender and they eventually became part of uh, the contract, which set out the very specific terms, um, uh, details all the key architectural aspects uh, of, of many of the structure, which are described shortly, and which were effectively project requirements, which couldn't be compromised in the DMB uh, stage. So let's move on and let's start talking about the, 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 the works themselves. Um, we'll see again the, the, the plan view you've seen earlier. And uh, there was a new civil engineer article that defined this project as a, a, a mini HS2. And that is due to the variety of structures that they are required to deliver the, the, this link over just a, the short two kilometers. So starting from where uh, the site, a plot, a great uh, um, area by the existing network rail station where we have a, an elevated uh, station, then there is a viaduct, and then we need to cross an A road and we do that in style with a signature bridge. And then we go through an area where we interface with the airport operation. This is the, the, the taxiway of the airport. And, and then we get into a, a situation where the, the airport, the site is extremely congested. So the, 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 the line is to go underground through a cut and cover tunnel and beyond that, uh, an underground station. So we got pretty much the whole suite of civil structures that you can conceive. So it was fun working on this project. And um, I think what well, best way to start is to see what it looks like. So this is site as two months ago. This is Parkway Station. On the right hand side, we've just seen the existing network rail station. You can still see the track. And the drone now is flying just above the viaduct deck. And you can see just a feed out of the, of the system there happening. And the, this viaduct needs to rise very sharply to achieve uh, uh, enough clearance with the A road. And um, that, that is the gateway bridge crossing. Now, for, for those of you that thought that you couldn't fly a drone by an airport operation, think again. What you see these, these are just the uh, uh, landing lights on the right hand side, and there is the runway starting just there. And then um, on the left hand side here, you see what it was the previous hair side land side boundary fence. On the right hand side, that is the new fence. So effectively, we grabbed a chunk of the airport plot and we carved uh, this uh, line to the chalk. And then the line uh, interfaces with the existing mid state car park, which we thought we could do whatever we wanted, but actually, this is a big money uh, um, generator for the airport. So we, we had to shrink the, 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 the plan as much as possible. And you see on the top left corner, uh, the area where we're aiming to, uh, which is the central terminal area where the terminal is located. And uh, the line needs to go underground in order to be able to get there because there was simply no space. And another bit cool uh, image, now the drone flying inside the new cutting of a tunnel uh, this tunnel goes underneath a taxiway. Beyond that goes underneath this, uh, the only road that actually leads into the airport, the crucial road that is the only access for the terminal for all the passengers. And finally arrives into the new central terminal station. We can see this is the place where the new platform would be, the public space. And beyond that, the back of house area and maintenance space for, for the trains. And this was quite a journey. I think uh, this was just a, uh, uh, a minute, uh, the, the real journey will take four minutes. So not, not that uh, longer than, than what you just seen. I think now I will pause and I will go through each individual component uh, one by one and highlight some of the key features. And we start again at Parkway Station. Um, I already mentioned this is a, an elevated station. And um, our architects has this vision of, of delivering the station through parasols, which is, you can see a, a conceptual sketch just on the, on the left hand side there which are effectively are mushroom structures. Um, and, and this is so that you would have uh, as much natural light as well as natural ventilation coming from the sides of the station. You wouldn't feel constrained by, by the structure on the outside. And the parasols have all the MEP systems embedded within it. And it's actually quite a great way of saving costs because everything is concentrated in, in, in individual points. Um, but of course, the criticality of this station is the interface with the Neto rail station. And for those of you who have worked with Network Rail before, know that having a very hard uh, opening date set as a deadline can be a challenge. Um, and because we need to do some modification to the existing Network Rail station to cope with increased number of passengers, we didn't want to expose our client to that risk. So we devised a design that uh, comprises a, a, a stage um, construction where, whereby you have a, a stage one that can open with almost no disruption, no intervention to the existing network rail station. 
literally just punching through a fence. Then the so-called stage 2A, which is the modification to the existing network of station, which is you know uh, introducing a new uh, overbridge, and then stage 2B, which is the link between those two components. Um, what you see here is just elevation of the stage one versus stage two, and you know stage two is achieved by just adding two more parasols, two more modules. And I'm pleased to say that at, at day zero, the opening day, uh, stage two uh, should should be uh, what what, what the, the user get, gets to use. Um, this is a cross section I guess, uh, showing again the central mushroom structure as we envisage a reference design. And there is not much to say other than uh, structure. The main challenge here was to have you know. Uh, over 10 meter long cantilevers either side of a very, very light structure, which we want to uh, displace in, um, in, in the wind. And we tied it down with, uh, with tension rods uh, to, 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 to minimize those effects. And this is a picture of sight. You can see how the initial vision of having, uh, you know, uh, as much as natural light uh, penetrating onto the concourse as possible, I think it, it comes to show. And, and this is also uh, another picture from the network rail platform. You can see the station in the background. And it, the idea is that you will get into the existing overbridge and then from there transfer directly onto the dart. Uh, you're re already at the level of, uh, of the platforms. Next on the, along the line is the viaduct. Um, and um, this could have been, uh, it is uh, 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 still a uh, ladder. Uh, uh, beam deck, but there's a lots of craft that's gone, and, and some of the principles that Nick touched upon earlier have been applied onto the family of piers, which you can see here. Effectively, these are quite sculptural, but the, the, the formwork was reused for each and uh, for the same formwork were used for all the piers, even uh, for the double piers, you can see. And this is again another picture that shows how the, the, the line um, needs to. Uh, um, raise up quite quickly. In fact, there's a 5% gradient there, which is at the maximum limit of, of what an APM can achieve, uh, ensuring passenger comfort. And after the viaduct, uh, there is the gateway bridge, um, which is the, or the prima donna of, the, of, of the, all the structures, if you want, which was uh, designed in conjunction with Knight's architects. Um, and the, 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 this responds to the client desire or having a, a, an unusual and a, and a signature statement, uh, something that will welcome the passengers because the, the A, A road you see there is the, the main access into the airport for the passengers. And the design wants to mimic, um, you know, the, the gesture of an aircraft taking off. Uh, so the key piece of this bridge is the top coat, which you see in the generation of the geometry here. Um, the, the, the mimics again the, 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 the aircraft taking off and uh, crucially through the diagram you see on the top left hand corner this was mandated in the contract uh, and the contractor had to deliver exactly the shape that was designed uh, during reference design. In terms of structure um, we obviously wanted every single piece of steel to work structurally not to have any decoration and so the, the bridge works uh, mainly as a truss and not so much as a truss towards the abutment on your right hand corner which is the eastern side but there is lots of nice details uh, in terms you know um, deck edge um, integrating the lights and uh, making sure that this um, uh, top cord is expressed as much as possible but there was a lot of even uh, the initial concept the reference design there was a lots and lots of work in getting all the connection resolved and sorted out fatigue checks making sure that the bridge was deliverable and VFK uh, elected to uh, assemble the bridge just a kilometer up the road. And they erected it uh, off site, as you see on the video at the moment. And then one beautiful, sunny uh, December uh, morning last year, it was a Sunday morning, uh, through a weekend blockade, they slid the bridge down uh, the A road. Um, and uh, it was a beautiful uh, feat of engineering. I mean, you, uh, the, the width of the deck, um, compounded by the fact that there is a horizontal curve, is actually wider than the carriageway. And so BFK had to elevate the bridge and make use of the, uh, the, the slope either side of, 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 of the road to make sure that the bridge uh, would fit. And it just about fits, as you can see, it's very, very tight, uh, extremely precision engineering there. And, and this is an image of the bridge just before being uh, put in its uh, final location. And that's a, a photograph later on that night when the bridge was finally resting on its, uh, on it, on its bearings. 
and this is another aerial shot. So we just seen the viaduct, uh, and we, see, we talked about the gateway bridge. Now we go beyond that in the area that is so-called open cuts uh, and troughs and slabs. And you know, there is not much here to say more than the, it was quite challenging and our geotechnical colleagues had a, a lot of fun in dealing with uh, some in, in not so competent chalk. And, and beyond that, as explained earlier, we cut through the mid car park and the objective is to get here in the central terminal area. That's where all the action is going. And the only way to do that is to, is to go underground. And this is a, a plan view. And, and, and that is uh, proposed and has been constructed through a cut and cover tunnel, which is the one you see in red. And I, I just want to highlight some key constraints. The tunnel needs to go underneath an operational taxiway. And because of the way the op airport operates, if you disrupt this taxiway, the entire airport operation grants to hold. Beyond that, there is the one and only access roads onto the terminal, so an extremely uh, key roads. And beyond that, there is the central terminal station, the underground station. And of course, um, right at the beginning of the, of, the, of the process, is it possible to tunnel underneath an operational taxiway? And um, this was done before uh, at Luton, um, uh, just uh, to build the underpass of the A road. So, the answer was clearly yes, we are our work cut out. And the, the, the solution we derived was to divert the taxiway slightly, build half of the tunnel, then divert the taxiway on top of the already built tunnel, and then build the other half. And VFK have done that, and they were nothing beyond that. What you see here is a picture I taken when I went on a family holiday and I, f I fl uh, flew from Luton back in the old days when you could do this. And what you see here, the site is so congested that the, the effectively the, the, the wings of the plane oversail the site. And so VFK were able to persuade the CAA to allow them to do that by placing this fence, which is effectively their side land side boundary. The rather than being a conventional vertical fence, is a, is a horizontal fence in this case, it's absolute genius. And, and this is another view where you can see this is the old alignment with the final piece of tunnel being backfilled. And this is the new screwed um, diverted taxiway alignment uh, with the aircraft just uh, transiting above uh, the, the uh, built tunnel. We move beyond the, the, the taxiway area and, 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 as, and this is the area where we need to tunnel very close. In fact, these uh, roads were needed to be shuffled a little bit. Uh, the only access road into the airport. Uh, and this is quite conventional cut, uh, cover uh, bottom-up operation for the, for the contractor. And just when you thought there wasn't enough constraints there, just uh, three or four years before this uh, scheme was uh, devised, uh, and, uh, they built a new footbridge whose foundation piles clash it directly with the only possible alignment feasible for the tunnel. So we devised this, this way that the, 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 the existing foundation needed to be um, supported on top of the new cut and cover tunnel. And VFK cho um, cut the piles and supported this bridge on, on hydraulic jacks for a couple of months with the tunnel was being built. And you know it was quite extraordinary to see people going uh, back and forth on the bridge deck with their trolleys going to the, without even noticing that uh, the bridge was supporting on jacks. Uh, absolutely great engineering there. And we finally arrive uh, at, the, at the last stop, which is the central terminal station. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is an underground station. Just one the, minute, please, Paolo. Yeah, I've uh, got two slides, no more. And the parasols here are repeated, and this time they allow natural light and, 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 and hair through the station. And on the elevation, you see the parasol area, which is the public space area, and the back of house, which is actually even longer, which is uh, of a different construction. Um, this image kind of show the congestion of the site, all the different constraints. Uh, I could uh, talk for hours about this. And I'll just close with a few images uh, of the construction. This is the public area. You can see the still work with the parasol. This is just before the lining wall were cast. And this is a view from above, uh, which is the same view that the passengers will see just before uh, getting onto the escalators to go down a, a, a platform level and a couple of beautiful shots of the top-down construction of the uh, back of house uh, box. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo, very much. That was uh, very, very interesting. Um, uh, what strikes me, um, please do uh, come along with some questions, folks. Um, 
kick your, put your questions on the Q and A. What, what strikes me uh, is the uh, the variety of, as you said, as yourself in the presentation, the variety of, of disciplines, of structural typologies, of, of, of things that you had to deal with uh, on on the job. I mean, just briefly, your own role. Um, where where did you fit into that uh, sort of network of of skills? Uh, I, what, was, what was your job? I was the the structural lead. Uh, so I was always seeing the structural design or all the structures that they just described. Uh, so, okay, there's a lot of different kinds of structures there. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a bit of, well, first of all, there's two things. In our team in Arup, we, we are called CSBT, which stands for Civil Structural Bridges and Tunnels. Um, so we, our group, which is approximately 70 people, has um, a range of structural engineers that deals from the big uh, bridges on one side, uh, the civil structures, and then the tunnels on the other side. And we work as a fully integrated team because we recognize that there is the need to deliver those types of sure, projects. Sure, sure, yeah, no question. Um, and myself, I have a bit of a strange background. I started as a tunnel engineer, in fact. I did a design, did a design of the cross board tunnels. And then uh, I decided to go over ground and moved on to bridge engineering. And that's what I've been doing for the last eight years. Yes. So okay. that, that helped me a lot in dealing with And so, so for you, what, what do you think, all that kind of variety of stuff, what do you think was the most complex and challenging, maybe highest risk uh, aspect of the project? Um, I mean, each one of those is challenging on its own ways. Um, and I guess that for a purely structural engineering terms, uh, certainly the Gateway Bridge uh, was, uh, you know, dealing with uh, an unusual structure with very high stresses there. But in terms of big risks, where the big money for our client, uh, you know, big risk allowances were, um, clearly uh, tunneling under a live taxiway upon sure. which the whole airport operation dependent, that was the, the, the major, major, major risk. Yeah, yeah. And the second risk also was the interface with the metro rail station and how to integrate the two stations as much as possible within the time constraints or opening in summer 2021. Yeah, you, you say the bridge, I mean, obviously, as you know, I'm a bridge man. Uh, you say the bridge was very highly stressed. Uh, it's not exactly the most efficient uh, of structural systems, is it, for, for that bridge? But it's, uh, it's very interesting. I'm not going to uh, uh, enter that comment. Somebody else might want to raise some comments on the bridge. So we have some questions here. Um, uh, car park, George uh, has mentioned something about the car parking. So car park is a large income generator for the airport, but of course this is going to change that, isn't it? Um, because the number of people driving to the airport presumably is therefore going to reduce. So how does that work in the sort of cost benefit analysis of the, uh, of the project? Um, well, I'm not too sure whether that is going to change. I mean, the, the car park is uh, uh, almost 100% uh, utilized throughout the year. And uh, I don't think so much at the moment, but it certainly was. And in the, in, although the, the model share in terms of passengers, there will be more share of passengers arriving by train, the overall number of passengers arriving to the airport uh, uh, is due to increase. So the, the user of the mid-stay car parks uh, are necessarily going to decrease. Uh, you know, there is already a number of private uh, sites around the airport perimeter that, 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 that trying to keep up with, the, what, with what is currently an extraordinary demand for park of parking around the airport. So I don't think there is uh, so much uh, in terms of reduction of need for that. In fact, quite the contrary, um, there is the provision to have an intermediate station at the Mid-State Car Park in order okay. to service it better. Yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Stephen Walsh has a very good question. Um, you remember the, the collapse of the Florida International University um, Bridge, uh, which was sort of installed in a very similar way. Obviously, there's some big differences between these two structures, yeah. um, very obviously. Um, but uh, you know, maybe there were some lessons learned. To, to what extent did did that happen? Because that must have been that must have happened in the middle of your um, um, design or construction period. Um, what lessons did you learn from that? Do you think? Um, well, first of all, we need, we should say that in our um, reference design, which was submitted for information as part of the tender we actually came up with three different ways of erecting the bridge and one which was the one that the contractor um, implemented in their own way uh, uh, slightly so we had the either the wheeling down the bridge down the road or uh, putting like a deck uh, uh, above the a road and kind of assembling it there or or, uh, or launching it into place and you know the alignment allows for that um but, you know, the, the, these are two very different structures. Uh, I know the Florida bridge, it was a concrete bridge, it was showing uh, high signs of distress, implementing some new type of connections there. 
um, and, and, and this was completely different. Um, uh, and, and so we, we read the report, so we great attention, but my colleague uh, um, uh, Charlotte uh, also was doing a study regarding uh, that technology. So, you know, there was great interest within the group. Um, but in terms of directly applying some findings to these projects, um, I, I don't think there were there were many over and above. You know, yeah. I think we have a line on the drawings to say this is a quite special um, engineering, uh, and, and there is the the need for a, an extremely competent uh, um, and detailed designer that is able to deal with that. With, with well, I'm very glad strategy. you say that. I'm glad you raised that. And I think this question, although you know, maybe looking at technology, uh, technical issues, I think that there are um, issues around competence and procedure that that this raises. And I'm very glad you you raise it yourself because I think this is an important point. So you, you know, although yes, you can point to technical reasons why that particular bridge collapsed. Um, you know, there a lot of them actually to do with who had the right eyes on the job at the right time. Yeah. And I'd just like to ask you the question in the context of a design and build project that you had here. Yeah. Yes, you, your team had obviously already done the design uh, to a certain level. You'd already done some erection analysis to a certain level. But then at point, one point you hand over to a contractor who's got to pick it up. Yeah. What did you insist on or what were you able to insist on regarding, for example, ongoing scrutiny by both yourselves at Arup, but also the designer, the detail designer, whoever that was, who worked with the contractor, so that there was always that competence throughout uh, on, on the site to ensure that it all was going as, as according to plan. Um, so we as Arup are uh, still part of the project. We are the engineer of record. So there is a, a number of colleagues of mine, uh, some of which I think are also online, uh, uh, based on site who support uh, uh, our client, which is the, the ultimate client of the project, and then and, and review the deliverables uh, and, and, you know, and, and approve them. Um, I'm not part of that team, uh, but I've been supporting them as and when uh, needed. And uh, I know there's been quite a long, uh, a, a, a long discussions about the bridge, um, especially because uh, the, 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 the detail designers uh, and, and VFK were more comfortable with the um, somehow contravening part of the definition design drawings and creating a, a, a spine within the deck uh, um, so that the deck could be uh, self-supporting uh, under certain load condition and certainly during erection and not having to rely on the truss above. And, you know, there's been lots of back and forth and lots of technical reviews about this. So we never lost sight of, of the engineering aspect. But, but also just, we, sorry to press you. Who was on site from the design team? So, um, from our team or for the design team? Sorry. Please. So, I mean, uh, VFK have their own designers, Tony G and Partners, and uh, they have their own structure engineers on site. And there is three colleagues of mine who are on site uh, permanent, not at the moment due to COVID, but they're, they're based on site, uh, just uh, on the portal cabins by Parkway Station. And they go out every single day, um, you know, taking photographs, okay. recording what's happening, and also review the technical submissions that they contract to must submit yeah. to our client before building it. Okay, if we have time, we might come back to that issue uh, in the general discussion later on, uh, because I think um, um, some of you will know, uh, I've spoken on this issue before. It's one of the big challenges we face uh, with the modern procurement processes that we use. Um, uh, not just the quality one that you did touch on, um, the quality being, you know, how do you, using that design definition, procurement uh, ensure that the contractor builds what you want, uh, mm -hmm. And that's got its own challenges as well. Um, uh, we may well come back to that. And please, uh, all of you, think of questions that relate to that and other things. We'll come to the other questions later on in the general discussion, but it's time now to move on to Tanya. Uh, Tanya is um, from Sweco and uh, leads the Urban Energy Division at Sweco. Uh, really good to have you with us, Tanya. Um, so how can designers contribute to help deal with the climate emergency? We've already been discussing this a little bit. Give us the answer. We need your microphone on, that would help. Your mic there, there we go. There Sorry, we go. yes, I was uh, sharing screen and I was like, where did the unmute mic button go? So yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're yeah. good to go. 
Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, so I am Tanya, and um, as Ian said, I lead the uh, Urban Energy Unit at SWACO, uh, which consists of about 25 people. Um, and we were launched January this year, actually, specifically to target the challenges that our public and private sector clients are facing in the wake of the climate emergency. So that is the raison d'etre for our entire unit. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to all these keynote speakers today. I'm not a structural engineer by background. I'm an economist by background. Um, and most of, the, most of the guys in my team are, are, are engineers of one type or another. A lot of civil engineers, um, structural engineers sit in another team. So I've really been enjoying the um, presentations today. Uh, particularly, I've noticed that you guys have access to a lot of great pictures, which we don't so much have in the kind of integrated energy system side that I tend to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and Ian, I also wanted to flag, I was looking for a kudos button earlier, actually, because you were just so consistently bringing up the importance of thinking about the climate crisis and how to address that in design throughout today. And it was so great. I was cheering you on, but yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you while you were doing so. Um, so in terms of what I'm going to be speaking about now, I'm conscious it's about lunch. Um, Ian said earlier that this is, that you know, he, he wants this to be informal. I'm all about embracing informality. I've timed this. Um, if I'm speaking at uh, my normal pace, it's like a 10 minute run through. So I, that means I'm probably gonna start waffling at some point during the presentation. Um, but kind of the key thing here is climate emergency is a big topic and particularly on how designers can contribute to dealing with the climate change. Uh, emergency is a big topic. Um, I've been, I was chased earlier this week um, by our marketing team because they wanted more details about what exactly the topic was going to be covering today. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I had no answer to them. So I still haven't gone back to them because I was still thinking about it this morning. I actually woke up at 5 a.m. this morning thinking about what I wanted to talk you guys through. Uh, and um, yeah, um, and to start with, I mean, do I, do I talk about what I could talk about, for example, what Tim and Steve and my team are doing. Tim and Steve, uh, when uh, they joined the company and, and over the last couple of years, they've become increasingly focused on the climate emergency. Um, to the extent that they've been campaigning internally that we no longer design natural gas CHP systems. So no more combined heat and power off of natural gas because you cannot be putting in natural gas combined heat and power uh, this year, next year, two years from now and say that you're still in line with uh, these signed declarations of climate emergency um, that we're seeing in all the councils. How can, you, how can you possibly be justifying that? So they've been campaign, campaigning internally that we should stop designing them um, with great success in the sense that we've lost quite a few clients who wanted us to install natural gas combined heat and power. And we've been saying that, well, it doesn't actually make any sense from a carbon perspective. You're setting yourself up to pay a huge amount of money 10, 15 years down the line when you have to pull out all of that infrastructure and try and see if you can replace it with a large scale heat pump on the same site, which hasn't been selected for, for its suitability for heat pumps. Um, so I could talk about what they're doing uh, in a professional capacity internally. I could talk about um, what they're doing in a private capacity. Uh, Steve's putting in a ground source heat pump as part of the base supported uh, heat pump scheme at the moment in his house. Um, Tim bought an electric vehicle recently and he's been sharing all of his insights on which electric vehicle is best suited depending on where you live and what and how much you drive every day. And, and they're running internal campaigns on that. I could talk about Kirsten, uh, who is an activist in, in our unit. She's involved in the 2050 Climate Group. She's involved in the UK Youth Climate Coalition. She's also a STEM ambassador. And she does that all alongside working full time also on, car uh, on carbon and dealing with the climate emergency. Her life is essentially fully around the climate emergency. Um, I could talk about each and every person in our unit and also more widely across the business, um, what they're doing specifically to address the climate emergency as designers, profession, professional capacities, but also as individuals, because the climate emergency is something that we, we have to address not only in a professional capacity, but also as an individual. Um, I'm not going to do that because it would take much, too much, way too much time. Instead, I'm going to try and concentrate on, on kind of high level lessons learned um, uh, and what you guys can do as designers uh, to help fight the climate crisis. Um, the key issue here, though, like the, the two minute version of, of what I'm going to be talking about is that you should 
should and could all be doing something. Even if you feel as an individual that you don't have the capacity to inform the transformational type of changes that we need to see by 2050, some of the points that have already been brought up earlier today about how transport is changing, for example, do we need cars? Do we need to plan for cars? Do we even, should we even still be building roads? Even if you as an individual don't think that you have that kind of power, you can still be making incremental changes to, to affecting the climate emergency. Uh, and we need both. Uh, and we need them now. So onto my slides. And firstly, an apology. Uh, I don't usually give a corporate slide, but I've had a number of really depressing conversations over the last couple of weeks where people had never heard of Sweco before. So just wanted to say that we are the largest architecture and engineering consultancy in Europe. Um, there's 1,400 of us in the UK across 14 offices. Um, uh, and we, our headquarters is based in Sweden, which is why our name is Sweco. Um, or at least that's what we assume. We've never seen the breakdown of, of why we're called Sweco, but we've been around for a while in, in one version or another. More importantly, um, actually, can you even, uh, let me minimize this window. Um, there we go. Driving impact through design. Where are the greatest potential areas for decarbonization. This is a, an image I stole from the, or borrowed from the Financial Times, an article that came out uh, in August, so not too long ago. Uh, they'd done some analysis on where the largest sources of our carbon emissions was coming from. Transport by far the largest. I've also circled residential business and public because as designers, um, even if you are mainly focused on, on, on rails and bridges, um, as, as far as I can tell from today's sessions, uh, you'll still be interfacing with the, car, with the design of residential business and public sector buildings. Um, and as you can see, particularly transport, residential and business are key contributors to carbon emissions in the UK. Um, energy supply, I've not circled. Um, there's a lot of good news stories in the general press about how we're doing in terms of decarbonizing the electricity supply. And it's really important to make that distinction between decarbonization of the electricity supply versus the general energy supply. Because one of the areas we're facing the greatest amount of problems in the UK, apart from transport, is heat. Decarbonizing heat is really, really difficult. Also decarbonizing the energy we use for particularly in the process um, industries. Uh, there is a small uh, industrial process bar here, um, but energy supply um, uh, up here also includes the kind of self um, other additional generation that process uh, need because there are heavy duty, he heavily intensive energy users. Um, so there's quite a lot, um, there's quite a lot of scope here for, for, for where we can decarbonize. Uh, now you could be saying, yeah, yeah, but you know, carbon, the climate emergency is a global problem or a national problem. And how much realistically can I do as an individual to, to make a difference here? And this is one of those cases where a picture speaks a thousand words because can the actions of an individual make a difference? Um, hopefully you all recognize Greta, Greta Thunberg, um, who is a, a, a lovely Swedish lady who's been campaigning um, to raise awareness about the climate emergency for several years now. Um, she, I think, is a prime example of, yes, an individual can actually make a difference in terms of, of uh, certainly awareness raising around the climate emergency, although I follow her frustrations that action is lagging far behind uh, uh, statements um, politically. Um, but certainly you cannot be using the excuse that your contributions as an individual are never going to be enough to make change because there is clear evidence that that is not the case. Um, so some of the work um, we've seen in our unit in particular, so this is uh, Lewis Barlow and Samantha Metaxas, they're part of our carbon team, uh, which is part of the unit. Uh, one of the projects they've been working on um, it w relates to the uh, Renfrew city deals up in Scotland around carbon reductions. And this plays into your role as a designer. When do designers, when are designers able to make a change? Where is it that your impact comes through? Um, if you see here, we've got a, we've got a carbon scale, a uh, lifetime carbon scale here and where you can really affect change. Um, and planning process, which was raised earlier today, that is an area where the largest potential carbon impact is. The example here is build nothing, um, which would have a sig significant improvement on the, on the carbon impact um, of what was proposed. Uh, although it has to be seen in light of what is, what would happen in the absence as well uh, of what is being proposed. 
but planning certainly is a key driver of removing carbon and that's both through build nothing and also through build less um, so there's significant significant potential there um, then we get to build clever and between the build less so between where the planner is handed over to designers and where we step in we start seeing a lot of things about building clever so the use of recycled aggregates the choice of concrete you're using um in your in your in your bridges and your roads um and the ability to the, the look at uh, the embodied carbon versus operational carbon in particular as part of that build cl clever process and then um, as you get to construction and commissioning um, there's the build efficiently so minimizing waste on site and then there's operational um, carbon but the largest carbon impact happens in the early stages which is why it's so crucial that designers are thinking about the climate emergency in their work every day every hour preferably every minute preferably if you can um, but it needs to be thought into what you are building and designing. Um, uh, Samantha and Lewis, um, uh, they are strong experts in this area. So they've done a lot of, um, they've, done a, they've done a lot of research, which I'm uh, delighted to be able to share. Um, so they've been looking at the relationship, particularly between carbon and cost. Now the blue dot you can see on the screen there, that is the cost. Um, dot and then the, you've got the carbon dot so the initial design let's say you have an initial sketch that that uh, has been proved through planning um, you then look at alternatives to that initial sketch is it worth building less and there's a direct link here between cost and carbon in that you can reduce cost and reduce carbon simultaneously so that's the best of both worlds really um, we then move on to build clever process where you're being more efficient about the choice of materials that you're using and the phasing of your project can play into this, all of the different elements that you'll see. Um, and there's still a direct link here. Building clever means that you are reducing carbon and you're reducing costs simultaneously. It's a win-win situation. Then things start to get tricky because if you really want to be moving towards a a zero carbon world, um, which is where we want to be going, but we're still very, very far away from that. You need to be looking at, at further implementation of low carbon materials. And that's where you start seeing a divergence between cost and carbon in that you get to a certain point where you can be reducing cost and carbon simultaneously. And after that point, you start having to pay more in order to reduce carbon. Um, and that is what uh, Lewis and Sam call the carbon cost tipping point. Um, what's really interesting at that point is to be checking how much more you're paying per ton uh, of reduced carbon because even though ideally you'd want to be seeing that strict linear relationship all the way through customers might be willing to accept a slight increase in costs particularly relative to the original design if it means a substantial reduction in carbon um, and what each customer is willing to accept is really heavily dependent on um, what their uh, what their priorities are, how 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 wedded they are to um, um, to the climate emergency. Um, I could give you a colorful example of a project I'm currently working on. With I'm dealing with um, a public sector client who is extremely wedded to the climate emergency. They're very very concerned about how they can redesign. Um, the energy system, city energy system that they have at the moment in order to ensure that they are carbon neutral by 2038. Um, the problem is that it's extraordinarily expensive for them to do so, particularly with the route that they have passed. But to them at the moment, it's a, it's a question of there is no cost so great that is not worth paying. Um, I have raised concerns that I don't necessarily think all of the cabinet members might might agree with that approach, particularly now that we're in a COVID situation where a lot of public sector funding has been diverted to dealing with the um, aftermath of the health crisis, plus the, um, the ongoing rising unemployment issues that we're also going to be seeing. Um, and that caused quite a bit of contention earlier this week um, because, uh, yeah, obviously uh, climate emergency is still the primary concern um, for certainly for, for this client, which I think is great. Um, it's just also can be a difficult sell sometimes politically. So traditional engineering will typically take you through that initial design, build less, build clever phase. That's already part and built into most of the engineering consultancy work that we see delivered. Um, but what we're also seeing increasingly now is um, clients are asking for more focus on this carbon cost management. They wanna go beyond the build clever phase, which is part of that traditional engineering design stage work. They wanna go to the next level and see 
well, I will accept a surcharge actually, um, but I want to see some. I want to see some real carbon impact based on that extra amount that I'm paying. Um, I'm almost already. Uh, I think. Uh, I think this might be my. This is my second last slide already. Um, in terms of this is a so this is a photo of um, the Leeds footbridge, which is over the River Air. Um, in the Climate Innovation District in Leeds, uh, connecting the South Bank to the city centre. Now, the reason I'm showing this picture is, um, so this is based on my understanding, um, structural engineers would be designing uh, this type of bridge in addition to all the, the large scale infrastructure projects we've seen earlier today. This is one of the most beautiful pieces of energy infrastructure that I'm familiar with, because not only does this footbridge encourage the use of cycling and walking, which means you're reducing um, emissions from cars uh, because this is, a, this is a direct link from the new developments in the South Bank to the city center. So not only are you reducing the transport emissions by, by being, getting more people out of cars and onto bicycles and, by, and, and walking, this bridge also includes um, a pipe, insulated pipe running through it at the bottom, you can't see it which is able to transport hot water, um, which is heated using waste heat from the Leeds Energy Recovery Facility to the other side of the river so that it can be used to heat properties, um, both private sector buildings and residential homes. Um, oops, sorry, both commercial buildings and residential homes. One of the biggest issues that we face in the energy systems team is that when we are looking at city centers or cities or urban spaces in general, and we have to design or upgrade an energy system which enables full decarbonization, we can look at the map and then we go, well, there's a highway here on the left-hand side, there's a railway up here on the north, and there's a river down here on the south. That means we can only physically put in the energy system bounded by those three areas because it's going to be too expensive to try and retrofit an energy connection across the river under the railway over the railway and um, over the motorway too expensive um, and i think it was uh, nick who said earlier why aren't energy and transport brought together or thought together could not possibly agree more. This is an excellent example of where transport and energy were thought in together, which means that um, Leeds, is, the Leeds city center is well underway in terms of fully decarbonizing heat um, for, to meet its 2038 climate ambitions because this type of infrastructure through the planning process, through the design process, got added in a pipe. It was through the design process actually where the council said, hold up and um, we know we've approved the planning for for the just the residential footbridge but we need you guys to put a pipe in it as well and got up got got that through the architect the designer worked together didn't impact the the it's a very beautiful footbridge um didn't impact the design aesthetics of the bridge uh, and means that you have access suddenly to a much wider range of of cheap decarbonization opportunities i'd really like for that to happen all new built transport please do think in how you're gonna how are you going to include the need for energy system infrastructure it's not just district heating i'm talking about here if we're going down an electrification pathway or if we go down a hydrogen pathway and i'm not going to try and guess which one it's going to be or what mix it's going to be but we need space on all of the transport corridors to put in our energy infrastructure and trying to retrofit that trying to go under a railway um, through the through the railway bridge or over it in an overpass or trying to get over a river normally it becomes prohibitively expensive and that cost gets passed right on to residents whereas it's if it's thought in into the design phase when you're building it it's a very very minimal additional cost um, so that is one area where i hope that you can all make a difference um, i'm gonna end up on this slide and this is my um this is my bad news good news slide so the bad news is um uh, I do believe we're heading towards a more pessimistic future. Uh, this generation is worse off in pretty much every respect relative to the previous generation. One or two, um, one or two excellent social issues notwithstanding. Um, in terms of climate, we're worse off. In terms of pollution, we're worse off. In terms of economy, we're worse off. Uh, even queries about education levels 
um, abound and health certainly also it looks like we're, we're increasingly getting worse off than the previous generation. The next generation is going to be even even worse position because we're going to be dealing with more extreme weather events. We're going to be dealing with mass immigration from areas which cannot no longer support a populace. Uh, populace. We're dealing with increasing political tensions because there's fights over water, there's fights over land, there's fights over energy. So there's a lot of doom and gloom as far as I'm concerned. I look at the next 20 years and I am very, very worried personally. The climate emergency, the political turmoil, the social unrest that we're going to be facing is only going to get worse. Um, we are, as designers, in a position where we have some of the strongest impact. Public sector first, you have to get public sector on board as part of the planning process to drive the transition, but they rely so much on us as designers to help influence them, to guide them the right way, to give them the tools to bring about the change that is necessary. Which brings me to the good news part of this slide. Um, so my, uh, originally I'm from this island, um, which is in the middle of Denmark. Um, and this island is called Samsø, um, and it's uh, known as the Renewable Energy Island. It, um, in uh, 1997, um, it had the dubious honor of winning a competition to prove that it was possible to decarbonize the energy supply fully within a 10-year time, time frame. No extra funding provide it just just uh, you know set a target and go go at it um, <laughs> and uh, it was the poorest or bottom two I think a lo local authority in Denmark at the time um, mass unemployment um, lots of businesses closing down it was actually a really depressing place to be it, it's no longer in the bottom two poorest local authorities it's not even in the bottom 10 anymore um, within between 1998 and 2008 it went from um, zero percent or two percent renewable energy installations to um, the equivalent generation of renewable energy on the island to power 140 percent of all of its energy supply um, and that includes it's a tourism hotspot so um, it has a normal population of three and a half thousand and that grows to over forty thousand in the summer not only was it powering enough renewable energy to decarbonize the local population consumption but it also covered all tourism on the island including all transport to it from the island and all of the food waste um, Andrew, from, i don't from want to interrupt your good news story but i do want to interrupt you so please finish up if you can please i am finishing up thank <laughs> you anyways the point is that uh, this happened between uh, 1998 and 2008 that's already a while ago it's it is possible it happened again a one local energy champion drove that change again demonstrating the power of individuals brought everybody else on board it was a hard slog but it's definitely doable um so I suppose the, the closing point would be we may all need to start somewhere, but that somewhere starts with thinking about what our role is and what we can do as individuals um, uh, professionally and, and uh, personally to, to combat uh, the climate emergency. So thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And that somewhere starts now, um, I think we'd also add. Um, You've you've almost um, stunned everybody into silence. Also, Satish has suddenly come up with a question. But um, uh, so please do put your questions on the on the sheet. I'm so glad that you were able to speak to us, Tanya. There's so many things that we'd want to talk about, and um, uh, I think uh, you know we can now uh, maybe take some later, later on. But um, you know the biggest question really is the do is how do we get to the do nothing, the say no scenario? Because I mean, so much of you know you show the chart where you know 100 of the opportunity stands you know we have 100 opportunity right at the very beginning of a job um and and actually you know the biggest challenge for us is the second 50 percent you know we can be clever and get down to 50 percent or maybe even better if we can redu reduce that much but actually the place where we're going to have the biggest impact is to say no right at the beginning um or to radically change a client's ambitions yes how, how can we change the incentivization of both you know, clients and developers who, who, who need to make stuff and do stuff, um, and also professionals like us who get paid on the basis of building things. Yes, um, well, this is actually a frequent uh, debate between the, the more senior management, Sweco and our unit, right? Because we do say no to clients. We say, we will not design that. And then the clients say, well, then we will go elsewhere. And we say, yes, that's fine. Thank that's you. Problem, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and the senior management is not always not always 100% uh, delighted that, that um, large scale clients will take their opportunities and go elsewhere. But it draws a clear line in the sand, right? We say, we cannot, we, we, cannot, we are compromised. We, we cannot do what you are asking us to do. We 
it just it fu it fundamentally goes against everything we stand for and even though I mean, I wouldn't say they all get mad and leave. Um, actually, quite a few, I'd say about 40% uh, will at least stop, think, and listen, and and reconsider. Um, so we that that is 40%. Uh, another 20% are the ones who get mad and leave, and then the 40%, the remaining 40%, will tend to waffle on for for a bit and, and get stimmied um, mm. uh, and wait for to hear back from others as well. Uh, it's not enough to be one consultant saying this to them. They want to hear it from multiple multiple opinions. But the 40% that that say, okay, well then what should we be doing instead? Those are the ones that we then see go forward and really drive change. You know, they're the ones who achieve the the highest global BREAM standards. Yes. Uh, there are two, uh, our buildings uh, team have a, the, you know, driving a similar approach. They're responsible for the two top global rank BREAM buildings in London um, mm -hmm. because they're just like, no, we're not. We're not. We're not. We're not designing high temperature uh, heat networks that are going to create a forty percent thermal loss within the building envelope. We refuse. <laughs> and they say, yeah. and if you want us to achieve a BREAM standard, then you have to do what we say. Otherwise, you know, we will go elsewhere. Sure. And that's the design team saying that to the client. So it's a big, big problem. And this was a lot of our conversation we had at the Henderson Colloquium a few uh, earlier in the week. Um, and and. Uh, more on that a little later on. Uh, Satish has asked a question. Um, uh, you know, it's an interesting one. There's a sort of balance, isn't there? You can you can use recycling material. Of course, you can recycle your aggregate and so on. But of course, that requires energy to break it down. Um, uh, and there's a sort of left hand right hand balance to to get right. In your experience, how do we get that balance right? Um, well. Uh... So, I mean, if it's concrete, concrete is one of the most carbon intensive um, uh, yeah, building components we have, right? Couldn't use it. <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is absolutely one of the most, most, most uh, carbon intensive. Uh, um, so if we're using concrete, first of all, should we be using concrete? If we're, if we're breaking down an existing building, how much can we reuse that concrete rather than just shipping it off to landfill? There is a clear carbon cost um, benefit there for sure that we've seen. Um, we're increasingly building timber uh, um, tall structures uh, out of uh, out of uh, timber, um, which you can also—I mean—that still has a carbon impact, obviously, but um, less so in concrete. So it's a question of how much can you, uh, like how much can you reduce the. Uh, and it goes down that carbon cost tipping point. I don't know if there's a really easy answer to that question. Sorry, no, I'm waffling a bit because no. that's a really complex question on a lot of levels. But essentially, you have to do the math um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, to, I, I, to see where the greatest impact is. That's right. And there's no question that we've got to start doing, you know, finding alternatives for cement. I mean, that 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 was very, very clear to us at Henderson. Yeah. Uh, you know, cement is a big problem and yep. uh, we've got to find uh, different uh, materials. Uh, and timber, yes, let's use more CLT. We can build, you know, 10, 12, 15, even 18, I think now stories uh, in, in timber. Um, so, you know, let's do it um, and make a change. Um, we've got to the point of the Young Designers competition and, and in order to try and keep to the time, I'm going mm -hmm. to keep pressing on. But uh, Tanya, thank you so much. Um, uh, all of you, I hope, have been listening keenly and taking notes. Um, and I'll come back if I remember, Enya, please remind me if I forget in the closing to say something about a future IAPSI event uh, around carbon, around climate, uh, which I hope you will all participate in. Thank you. Tanya, thank you. Um, moving on to our young designers. Um, so we've been running this design competition. This is something we've been doing now for a few years at Future of Design. And this year, the challenge was set to the designers to come up with a design for a footbridge, uh, which was going to, um, in, in, the, in the context of so, uh, segregation, of uh, uh, social distancing, keeping people two meters apart. Um, and um, provide a link between two buildings and stations and so on. It's actually really quite a challenging brief uh, when I had a look at it. Um, so, um, and, and uh, I'm delighted to have three speakers who are going to talk to us in, in rapid succession. Um, and actually, interestingly, talking about the fact that we are an international organization, haven't, haven't, isn't it interesting that so many of the names of our presenters today uh, at least suggest uh, that they come from uh, outside the UK, maybe originally, maybe not, uh, but uh, it's a lovely international sound, so I'm not even going to try to pronounce some of these names. Uh, Nora Facini, Andrea Valeria, I'm guessing Italian, I don't know, but uh, yes, maybe both. somewhere close. Um, I'm not even going to try this one, but Raul, uh, Lucas and Ruben, um, there's a sort of Spanish sounding uh, name to some of those names. Um, I'm not sure if that's right, but uh, yeah, that's, the, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, and Gian Piero, uh, that's, uh, is that another Italian? Yeah, name? it's a difficult, I know. Uh, <laughs> Okay, but listen, wonderful to see you, and uh, let's uh, let's hear from Nora first. Oh, thank you. I will share my screen one second only. Hope you all find it. 
here. So uh, thank you all. My name is Danny Norfaccini, as uh, I said, and I partnered with Andrea Valerio to present our idea of fruit bridge. Uh, so for our design concept, basically uh, is derived uh, by creating something appealing and versatile and also is very respectful of the social distancing measures to both then connect and separate at the same time the people flow uh, at the same time so the concept is deeply embedded in the our naked structural system we have chosen uh, where the spine girder varies tides uh, along the path meeting as well architectural and structural fracture needs basically uh, the, the girder as you can see from uh, the same second picture from the right uh, gently varies and also uh, dives into the single sculpted uh, central pier around which we are proposing also a sort of uh, uh, two systems of stairs rising up from the metro station. Indeed, as you can see from the top right uh, uh, key, um, you, like the, the S shape of the bridge uh, was generated by a um, uh, thought uh, about how to best connect or trying to best connect uh, uh, all the uh, main key points of the site. So um, both the car park and the shopping mall, but also the tube and the train station access uh, and the square in between. Uh, we have been also strongly committed in trying to define a simple but strong detail surrounding the sculptured nature of the, of the structures, which defines the concept, as you can see from the right sections throughout the wall bridge path. So both also uh, we have uh, a, also a, uh, some architecture features such as a, a double glazed barrier in the middle, uh, which uh, varies has the height uh, uh, of the gear there, the spine gear there, and it gives also a pleasant uh, also um, alternation of opaque and transparent uh, surface along the path, or integrated systems such as the lighting system, which uh, announces the shaped nature of the our structure basically during the night and the day. Um, finally, also so uh, simplicity for us is a simple uh, added value which is also strong and uh, uh, enhances our concept design, but also our construction and buildability. Indeed, uh, during construction phases, we try to minimize also site operation for a wall range of advantages from buildability, costs, health and safety. So again, the central pier becomes the center of our uh, construction as well, which is supposed to be built first and then um, the two, splice, two side splices of the bridges, 20 meters long each, will be fixed from, uh, on the next two. So I think that overall the idea of the foot bridge it was to be versatile, appealing and as well optimized solution, trying to be as well flex flexible and trying to push for the social distance in this moment of time. Thank you, I think. Sorry, uh, thank we are you. not in Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Nora, very good. Um, and thank you for keeping to time. Um, a, a beautiful bridge, beautiful presentation. So we go straight on to, to Raoul. Uh, we'll take, uh, a little later on, we'll take one question for each, each of the teams um, because we're so limited on time. But uh, so think about uh, which question you want to ask for Nora. Uh, but now Raoul, your turn. Uh, yeah, let me, let me share my, my screen. Uh, just one, one second. Uh, yeah, uh, can you let me know if you're seeing my screen? Yes, that's good. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Um, and full full screen. Um, so you're you're, you're seeing the poster we're, right we're, now. We're seeing your script at the moment rather than the illustration. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. That's right. Uh, uh, now you should be seeing there the, we go. There the we poster go. right that's, now. That's okay. Right. Th that's perfect. Thank 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 you very much, Ian. Okay, uh, so first of all, right. with, good afternoon. Uh, and yes, I would like to say that thank you very much to the organizers for, for including our proposal within the shortlisting ones. And just very briefly in the next four or five minutes, I would like to present the main characteristics of our, our submission. 
Uh, so from the beginning of, of, this, of this competition, we look at the design brief, and as I think you were already mentioned, Ian, uh, it has quite a lot of different um, constraints that we have to look into. So uh, in terms of um, interconnecting different transport modes, the, um, uh, we have the, rail, uh, the railway, we have the, um, uh, the, and the um, highway, we have to maintain social distancing. So this is actually quite, quite um it's quite uh, it's quite defined for the different different um constraints so this uh, uh for us we, we look into it in a way that we wanted to come up with a very integrated design that is a design that integrate all these constraints into it directly and this naturally led to what you are seeing at the moment on the screen that is what we call the hub concept uh, that the main function of it, as is of, of a hub, is to interconnect different uh, uh, pedestrian flows uh, into a into a single in, in into a single bridge, and doing so, and especially now, it's very important in a safe way and uh, where uh, social distance is 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 possible to to be maintained throughout. No. Uh, from this first concept that uh, the hub, we actually uh, wanted to look the most uh, adequate structural type for it. And, it and structural type that was actually suitable for an urban environment. So we wanted to be something that could be, could be integrated within the, the, the an, an urban area. No? Uh, this uh, led us to a composite bridge design that uh, you, you can see in the, on the screen. And probably uh, what is calling more your attention is the, the central pier. So uh, you can see here that is probably the most architectural feature of the, of the footbridge itself that uh, um, we have actually, um, just in a, from a preconcept point of view, we have actually optimized the, the geometry of it. This, as you can see, it has uh, each of the pylons has a different angle. So we have tried to optimize this shape to, uh, so we reduce the bending moments on the, uh, on the pylons itself and also on the pile cap that sits below. Um, uh, also, we have uh, reduced the amount of material between the pylons itself, uh, and that actually gives gives the, this um, sculptural shape almost like that, almost looks like standing stones. No? Uh, I would say. Um, Actually, this central pier, the, the shape of this central pier, the, the specific geometry, actually, from a design point of view, give, gave us three main advantages. Uh, one of them is uh, reduces the span length because of its shape. So, and actually, also to have three spans instead of two, so actually uh, uh, works a bit better in terms of construction sequence and and uh, and also give, gives up this very allows us to give this very slender. Um, Tech, uh, shape uh, facilitates construction, as, as you just mentioned, and also allows to integrate the the two lifts that you can see here, and also the stairs within it. So we have two two stairs, uh, one or two that goes to each side, and and the lifts also integrated within it. Uh, the bridge deck is uh, basically uh, comprises a steel box girder, one and a, one minute, yeah, and a concrete a concrete um, deck on top and the um, the um, uh, parapet actually comprises a steel um, a steel mullions and a, a glass uh, and glass panels as you, as you can see so i think more or less this summarizes uh, the main characteristics of our design and i think from our point of view we have achieved a quite aesthetically pleasing solution that uh, addresses all the constraints, uh, not just battery adapting the design to seek beauty, but doing so in a structurally efficient way. And I think uh, that more or less summarizes all. And I think happy to take questions at the end. And yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you very much to team 13. Um, and we'll move swiftly on to the last one of the three shortlisted designs, team 16, Gian Piero. Uh, tell us about your design. Can you share your screen? John? So, Raul, you need to stop sharing your screen, please. Yes. That's okay. It. And then if Jean-Pierre, you can share yours, hopefully we'll be back in business. Yes, it, there we go. Very good. Yes. I have a short presentation. I promise. Oh, wait. 
respect the time. So, oh. so I'm going to talk about my project for the competition. Yeah, there are some contents. At first, I want to talk about the, the concept, which is part of me, the project, and then I show all the project in all its aspects. Yeah, we have an extract of the, um, oh, sorry, of the brief. And uh, I underline uh, probably the most important requirements, the distancing is maintained and non-congestion. Most important because actually it's a bit of paradox for a bridge to keep people distant there to connect. Uh, my interpretation of these requirements was to at first allow people to understand the space in order to keep the right distance and then keep fluent to the pedestrian flow uh, in order to avoid any contact, accidental contact. So one queue is definitely what happened in uh, long tunnels. This is a picture of the Mont Blanc tunnels between Italy and France, where there is a panel which required to keep 150 meters distance between one car to another. And uh, it could be difficult for the driver to understand this distance without any help. So there are marks on the floor or blue light on the right and left hand side, which helps drivers to keep the right distance for safety. In terms of uh, keep fluent the pedestrian flow, um, we start from uh, an heterogeneous group of people because the link bridge is between a car park and a shopping mall. Uh, I mean, people is different for pace, for the direction and the sides because uh, the shopping mall, you can go alone. You can go with your family with a shopping car. Uh, while the ideal situation, situation in uh, is soldiers, I mean, uh, same pace, same direction, same size. This is another cue that I try to take an account for the project. But uh, so to group and all the people as much as possible. Obviously, I know that uh, bridges and uh, <laughs> soldiers, marching soldiers, uh, don't get along. So this is a panel of the Albert Bridge. So my idea is not to group people like soldiers, but uh, it's, a, it's an idea. Yeah, it's a um, section, 3D section of the project. It's a three-dimensional truss, steel truss, where at first, in order to try to keep homogeneous as much as possible uh, the flow, the pedestrian flow, I divided in two parts one uh, by direction, one toward the shopping mall and one toward the car park. Inside every part, there are two lanes more. Uh, I call slow and fast lane. When I say slow, I mean the lane is reserved for people who have a slow pace or disabled people, families, people with shopping car, while the fast lane is reserved uh, for people that is in a hurry, I won't simply walk and go straight uh, to, the, to the direction. Then, in order to allow people to keep the right distance, I imagine these red stripes all along the path of the bridge uh, are one meter width and one meter span. It. In this way, it's very easy for a person to understand the right distance to keep from the person in front of him. Uh, the stripes are not only visual but are tactile paving because we can imagine two scenarios where are people who are vision impaired so they can feel, perceive stripes, uh, tactile, uh, tactile stripes. Otherwise, if the bridge is crowded and it's difficult to perceive the wall perspective of the bridge, uh, you can feel the tactile paving more than see exactly where the stripes are. Uh, the pattern red and white is not only on the stripes, but is only the glass panels, because the two main direction divided by a glass wall, where the, um, the, the same pattern, colored pattern is repeated all along on the, uh, on the screens, on the, uh, on the glasses, and on the railing as well. I use a lot of uh, glass in order to keep as much as uh, light, the impact, the visual impact of the bridge. And uh, yeah, glass, glazed roof is provided on the slow lanes because obviously the link bridge is outside, so want to protect people from rain. One minute, please. Yes, this is the plan and the elevation. 
So we have a steel deck with a composite slab. Here we have the finished floor where this, the, the two lanes are one. Two, the first lane is 2.3 meters width, the slow is 2.75. The bottom of the bridge is slightly chambered in order to allow the clearance required underneath. The structure, as I said, is a three-dimensional steel truss that is, works very well in terms of torsion, possibly torsion or flexure due to the, is a free span bridge. And the composite slab is a choice to help as well with the dynamic behavior of the bridge in terms of people walking. Obviously, uh, further analysis are required. And then this is the facing five phase. At first, there is the construction of abutment, a temporary piles, and uh, storage, storage on site of the steel segments. The steel segments are assembly on site and then uh, pull up on the temporary piles and abutment. And then there is the, the conclusion of the structure is uh, with the RC slab pouring and then the finished construction. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Well done, um, Team 16. Uh, thank you so much, Gian Piero. Okay, so um, time just for one question for each of the teams. We've actually only got uh, questions so far um, aimed at Nora, so we'll start with that, but see if anybody else comes up with any in the, in the meantime. There's a couple of questions there, so I'm actually gonna combine them. So um, uh, access to the station, you, you talked about the, the ramp um, uh, and the stairs down to the stairs down there. Uh, how is that materialized? And, and torsion, torsion in your, in your structure, how's that work? Torsion, well, actually, is uh, the section in itself help because it's a, um, um, a, it's a closed section. So at least, uh, as you can see from the detail, I hope to zoom out a bit. This is a hand-drawn detail, but at least it shows the trapezoidal box girder section, which is quite simple also to produce inside, but like, um, to produce uh, and place inside, but uh, it helps a lot also for torsion or any of these efforts. And anyway, we can place also internal plates in, uh, in, in where we have more critical problems about this. And also this section as well helps because uh, it's supposed to gently slides down um, into the middle of the pier. Uh, I don't know if this was very clear from the first part of the presentation, but this is how we want to connect also the tube in itself, because basically here we just drawn a proposal really for two stairs in a very lightweight because, way, because we thought that this was necessary as well, but uh, half of these cross sections can um, gently come down to the ground level in so two separated anyway uh, path, path as we can see as well from okay. the 3D. So it, it did seem a little bit uh, wishful thinking with the, the ramp sort of appearing to be infinitely thin. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, it's, it is, because it it's more proposal. There, I can understand the question uh, that uh, that was asked there. Yeah, um, the, does anybody have any you. questions for the other teams? Um, I, I, I have one actually for, for uh, the last one, Gian Piero. The, 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 you, you have the one meter module everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it feels rather busy. I mean, you could achieve the same effect, couldn't you, without having to necessarily have, you know, mullions every meter, you know, all the glass panels one meter long. You could do it with the surfacing in the floor. You could even do two meter panels. Did you feel that you could make it less busy? Uh, prob yes, probably yes, because actually one meter is a short span. But um, I, I literally read the brief to respect as much as possible social distancing. So now when we, everyone talk about this famous meter between one to another, and I want to use as a, a, to repeat as much as possible this concept. Yes, it looks busy, but uh, it's, a, it's not a normal bridge. It's not a bridge for socializing for visual I mean, uh, for uh, good aesthetics is a bridge uh, which uh, help uh, to respect yeah. this odd condition. Sure, okay. And, um, and Raul, you had a, a, a suggestion, I think, if I got you right, uh, of um, temporary glazing screens to separate people, which would then be removed after, is that right? Yeah, yeah exactly. That's one of the things that we look uh, into that, and actually that goes back with, and I think uh, Nick commented on the morning that 
Yeah, I mean, we are designing, so especially civil infrastructure is designed for 120 years. And uh, in terms of designing for the, pan, pan, for the pandemic, I mean, we will have the pandemic with us probably for, I mean, at least a year, two, three, four, no one really knows. But, no, but up to which point makes sense to design uh, for um, COVID, uh, for the structures are going to be there for the next 100, 120, 150, 200 years. No? Yeah, so right. in, that, in that sense, we... We made it COVID proof, but we made it in a way that once the pandemic, uh, I mean, in a post COVID area, uh, things can be removed. And if we have a pandemic in the future, they can be put back. So yeah, the, the, the uh, for instance, we have between the two stairs, we, we have temporary, temporary glazing, tempor temp uh, temporary parapet that they can be removed, especially because uh, in terms of uh, flux of okay. uh, pedestrians, you may have a uh, difference in, in, in the morning than in the afternoon and things like that. So that okay. will help. Sorry, uh, I would like to also to underline how easy it was part of our concept as well in the central part of the barrier as well. Yeah. Sorry, just yeah, a no, that's small actually right, highlight. Mark. Um, you, you can all see the, um, at least I imagine you can see, maybe you can't, maybe it's only me that can see it. Uh, I can see the polling going on. Um, I can also see that only 63% of you have, have voted. Somehow or other, there's a way of voting for these three um, competitions. Does, is this visible to everybody, Anir, or am I, is it just you and me can see this? I'm not sure. Maybe maybe this is just because I'm I'm uh, I'm in the privileged position of being able to see it. Which, so I'm not going to say in case I give the game away. Still yeah, what? I don't think everybody can see the results. Okay, good. Well, I'm, everybody I'm can I vote. I'm glad I didn't uh, didn't reveal uh, what the um, the the audience are thinking. So there's still time to vote. Um, so vote on whatever button it is that you may be able to see to be able to um, to vote for what, which one of those three that you like best. And we will come back to that at the end. Um, but for now, we've got a few more minutes to discuss um, the other two presentations as well. So Tanya and Paolo, please turn your um, microphones back on. Thank you to your to you three presenters, uh, young presenters of your designers, uh, your designs uh, from your competition. Thank you very much indeed. Well done. A challenging thing to do. But let's go back to the two present presentations we heard earlier on from Paolo and uh, Tanya from Dart and Carbon. Um, any questions um, from anybody? on this. Satish has been making some questions or comments about um, CO2 and embodiment and so on in cement. Um, I mean, I think this is a well-known issue and, and, and you know, I don't think we really just spend too much time uh, talking about the thing in detail because we all know the problem with cement. We all know the problem with concrete. At least I hope we do. Um, uh, if we don't, then you really need to educate yourselves. Uh, let me please just use a moment to do a quick plug, actually. Um, wearing one, one of the other hats I wear, of course, is from the iStructE, um, and I'm going to just wave at you as a structural engineer, because the current uh, edition of the structural engineer, if you don't get it yourselves, please make sure you find somebody who's got it, um, because uh, we're very much focusing at the moment at the institution on this carbon issue, and in fact, last month's edition as well is worth finding because there's a lot of really useful stuff, uh, a really important stuff in there about what are we doing? Um, so who wants to ask some questions uh, on, on these uh, other the topics we had earlier on? Um, Tanya, I'd love to, 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 to talk more about the, the, the carbon thing and this sort of cost tipping point, which you mm -hmm. very clearly showed. There comes a point where it's gonna get more expensive mm -hmm. um, to, to get down to zero. Mm -hmm. um, what are the sort of things that we're, we're doing what are you seeing as the actual things that people do is this a different material is it a different process what are the things that actually are costing more um i mean there's a huge variance um between types of projects like i mentioned before i'm, I'm i mainly work on the energy system side so um i mean some of the projects we're involved in and i like uh, the, we're doing the largest smart city energy regeneration project in Peterborough city center, which is about decarbonizing across all vectors. So transport, heating, electricity, uh, and then putting in storage and smart grid controls. Um, so I, on the, I work very much on the decarbonizing the energy supply side um, and then implementing that in buildings. What are we seeing? We're seeing that, um, we're seeing that 
um, operational carbon, lifetime carbon from, from buildings is still significantly higher than the embodied carbon. There, more attention is being paid to embodied carbon, which is great, but operational carbon tends to be what drives the overall lifetime carbon emissions of projects. And that's irrespective of whether it's roads, where the operational carbon is the emissions from cars, um, or whether it's um, buildings and how they're used currently. And the what, what's that British saying? Uh, pennies prevention is a pound cure. The cost costs uh, the cure is a pound, and, and uh, the the prevention is a penny. There's a old British uh, saying. But... I, I've not I've not got that one in the thing, my <laughs> my fingertips, but maybe somebody has. I, mean, I think you mentioned embodied carbon and, and, and operational carbon, but I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, actually, uh, in the building field, in the building structures field that we we, we work in, uh, not sorry, not structures in buildings. Um, the operational energy issue is largely being solved, isn't it? No, um, not let me, let, let, in, in comparison, I mean, put it this way, we have, we have made a massive impact on operational energy in the last 20 years. Um, what we have not done is made any impact at all on the embodied energy. That's true. But the and embodied energy is the thing that's really challenging us. And, well, and that's the thing that, that most of us are now becoming uh, aware of, is the, the, the stuff that we, the energy we use in terms of, you know, every ton of concrete, every ton of steel and so on. Mm. Isn't that right? Well, um, yes and no in the sense that, yes, you're right. We've made huge strides in terms of dealing with operational energy consumption uh, and embodied carbon, uh, sorry, operational carbon, um, and embodied carbons kind of slip below the radar. Uh, and that's something that's just recently coming up now. So I agree with that. Um, but the impact of embodied carbon versus operational carbon in buildings is still very heavily weighted on the operational carbon side. Most of, you know, residential, uh, to give you an example, social housing buildings in London, the average, uh, they, typically a social housing uh, flat complex will use um, an on-site boiler for heating, uh, for both space heating and hot water purposes. The average efficiency of that boiler in terms of converting natural gas into viable heating um, that's used heating in each of these flats is somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. That's 70 percent waste. Yeah. That's, okay. that's now. That's yeah. happening right now. Yeah. That has a huge operational carbon impact. It's true that operational carbon through, for example, uh, the decarbonization of the electricity grid is massively helping um, in terms of the overall carbon impact of buildings. But if you're dealing with uh, buildings on gas boilers, which is still the vast majority of all existing properties in the UK, then it's a different scenario because yeah, the no, I mean, it's, it's, I'm sure you're absolutely right. I mean, I think first, perhaps what's in my mind is that you know we have seen um, changes in building regulations, for example, which focus on uh, on operational energy and, mm -hmm. and reduction of, of 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 energy heat loss and all that sort of stuff. But we've not seen corresponding change. Yeah in how we build in the first place yeah. uh, and that i am absolutely certain is is, is coming um you all got very quiet apart from the fact that you, some of you have answered the, the penny pound question thank you for that um but please do keep your your questions coming for these two and indeed actually for any of our speakers if you've still got questions for our uh, earlier speakers um, I, I see that Clotilde's question is there, but I think we did answer that one uh, about the, the way that COVID has been uh, affecting our projects. Uh, we've been talking about that quite a lot, um, and I think strategic questions we dealt with. So please do keep your questions coming. Uh, but Paolo, to come back to you and the question that I sort of threw at you just at the end of uh, the earlier session uh, about the uh, design definition procurement process that you yeah. uh, at Arab are very good at promoting. Um, where you know you you do quite a lot of design work up front, you know your client is going to basically pay for your for the design twice because you're going to do a, 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 almost a fully detailed design uh, and then define bits of it that have to be maintained by the design build contractor who will of course appoint their own designer. In this in your case for the bridge, it was Tony G and partners, um, uh, and and they are then constrained by by the design definition relatively easy to define overall issues, overall geometry, materials and so on, but but allowing enough flexibility for the contractor and his designer to innovate, to find cost-effective solutions and all that sort of stuff is really important as well, isn't it? You don't want to pin it down too much. And how yeah. do you deal with the details? Because the details are often so important. 
Um, I mean, there's two questions there, I guess. Well, the first one, I totally agree with you, that we shouldn't be constraining the, the, the contractors or the supply chain too much. So it's all about striking the balance between what are the client expectations and, and, uh, and uh, what, we do, what type of freedom uh, do you allow? And obviously in the past, things had gone spectacularly wrong on the, the wrong side, whereby the clients expected to have a certain product ended up having a totally different product. Uh, and perhaps not getting as much as the savings that were made throughout the process. So these aims are rebalancing it. I, I, th I still think we have it fairly right. I mean, as I think I, I mentioned in the presentation, um, the actual final gateway bridge is not compliant with the definition design, uh, insofar that um, there was a, there's a slightly different structure has been proposed and there's been an adult discussion, a conversation on the technical level, why that was felt by the contractor being better and we have finally advised our client there's obviously there's been a tension but finally we advise our client to accept it and that's what's been built even though it still looks uh, pretty cool i would say and uh, the the and the second question was about the details um i mean um nothing is stopping uh, the tender to 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 mandate a type of details i mean and i think there was even in the slide for for the for, Put it that into the context, I mean, there was details of the deck edges, details of the handrails provided in the in the tender pack. Then, of course, all the details of the cladding of the stations. There was a lot of thoughts about details, and it's, it's been we 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 did back at the reference design stage, which then I think helped the contractor, especially in this time in this particular project where they had a very limited duration of time to do their own design and then to deliver the project. When you see that you have a baseline already that is quite rich in details that gives you confidence that some of the key issues have already been addressed, I think that helps the contractor. But do you know, surely that deliver. begs the question, and why do you do a design and build contract? If you've designed it to that level of detail and the contractor yeah. hasn't got time to change anything anyway, why are you doing a design and build? But it's a good question. I mean, ultimately it gets down to risk allocation, uh, and of course, and uh, you know, doing a design built enables you... And there's shift. a whole conversation around risk, isn't there? About well, yeah. who, you know, where do we place risk? Clients just want to get rid of the risk. Remember. Um, and it's always going to be somebody else's fault. Um, and, and I think no, in this the problem we see is because of that very, very factor, isn't it? But remember, in this particular project we, that we're talking about, um, the system supplier was not known because that was another open tender. And I'm not too sure how familiar you are with the APM technologies, but they are very different systems out there. So we design a civil work that could cater for all the possible system uh, at day zero, but also crucially after 30 years when the system needs to be replaced, but the civil structures are still there. But the, once the system contractor was selected, uh, there's been extensive dialogue between the civil works contractor and the system contractor and yeah. all of those interfaces that we constrained to a certain degree needed to be resolved. So uh, more design was in, inevitably required for, for the Luton Dart at least. Yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, you know, this is a big topic, uh, which we don't have time to go into in the next five minutes, but um, uh, thank you for, for that. There are some questions here. Um, <clears throat> So yes, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that bottom one at the moment, um, the client <laughs> designer doesn't want to take the risk rather than the take ownership of the pride that comes with it. Uh, I, I, I think I might leave that to one side because that's a little bit, um, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, it's a good point. It's a very well made point. Um, uh, but uh, I think that's, that's not the, the primary reason why we use design and build. Um, uh, Premature demolition of buildings for economic reasons. Yes, Satish, you're absolutely right. Developers get their money back in five years, and so they're not too concerned about long life. How do we make sure, everybody can answer this question, how do we make sure that the long life is really uh, thought about? In bridges, we know, we're, we're used to it. We're kind of used to making sure that we've got a 120 year kind of mindset. But what about in buildings? Making sure that people are thinking long life, reuse, you know, change of use, all of that kind of stuff. It's, if I can jump in first then there, Ian, I mean, it circles back to what you were saying about why, why do a design and build contract, certainly with, um, if you're dealing with buildings or the energy, certainly the energy systems infrastructure within buildings, uh, what we see is design, build, operate and maintain contracts tend to be yep. um, uh, more beneficial of ensuring the lifetime costs of those assets remain low. 
Um, and there's there are an, any number of horror stories of uh, design and build energy infrastructure and buildings which gets handed over from a developer to uh, an operator uh, at, yeah. at after uh, after the initial build out is complete and they then have to spend a fortune on, on essentially re, re redoing um, a lot of the elements uh, yeah. because there's no thought to the lifetime costs thought into it. Um, but where that is, where we're seeing that change happen, though, is increasingly these operators, energy operators, are pushing back on the developers and saying, "Well, we're not going to pay much because it doesn't, it's not worth much." Yeah, so, yeah, if they yeah. want, if the developers are keen on recouping their costs after the design mm. and build phase, they need to make sure that they've at least um, legally um, yeah, covered yeah. themselves. Stephen, I can see you're still there. Um, I don't know whether it's just your computer's alive or whether you are as well. Um, but um, yeah, please, uh, what's your thought on this? Yeah, no, it's a it's it's a it's a real challenging um, area because, like you said, in in the past, it has all been <clears throat> about doing things as cheaply as possible. But I think I do feel that there's been a little bit of a shift um, more recently, and and I think it's it's the the key thing that we can do is have those discussions with the right people um, because you know you can be working on a project and say the project manager or somebody who's uh, just looking after that project will have their own um, their own goals and what they'll be focusing on. But you know, we, we kind of need to bypass that and get further up the chain um, and have those sorts of discussions. You know, a bit more strategically and just a bit more thinking, a bit more holistically. And you know, we're we're kind of finding that with um, you know the, the UN SDGs, um, where yep. you know this is. This is, this is a framework that yep. we, we kind of need to follow. And, and often what we're finding on new projects now is that we arrange a, an SDG workshop. And, and again, we're not having the discussions with the, the people involved in the specific project. It's much more yep. higher up in the chain. Yeah. And, and I think that, th thank you, Stephen, because that really leads into the question that Jesse has posed. Uh, you know, who actually is it who's really going to make those first steps in, 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 the, in the chain? Because Clearly, we need to get clients, local authorities, people involved at the front end to accept, for example, that the, the, the UN SDGs are the framework under which we've got to be doing all of this. Uh, and that will have an effect to, uh, on every decision that's made on the project from the very, very first. Um, who wants to just comment on that? I mean, who, 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 how do we get those people? How do we get the clients and local authorities to, to understand and only commission projects that are done in the right way? Paolo, do you want to answer that? Well, that's a, that's a very difficult question. I mean, this obviously needs to be um, legislation in place. Um, I mean, for instance, I've been recently working in, in some uh, bridge projects in the Netherlands, a refurbishment of bridges, and uh, there is a key constraint there that for all new investment in infrastructure uh, that needs to be uh, carbon neutral, uh, and that is a uh, a precondition uh, yeah. to to receiving yeah. funding. Yeah. Yeah. So, a legislation that's... level that constrains yeah, you. And, but Boris is saying build, 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 isn't he? And, uh, you know, uh, which is probably not the right sort of message uh, for, for, um, for a situation where we're trying to build less uh, or at least build more responsibly. Um, one, one more answer to that question. Uh, Tanya, go on. So the well, question about who, how do we get, how do we get uh, the clients and the local authorities to play ball? I'm I mean, I think you sort of tried to answer that earlier on, perhaps. Yeah, well, I mean, I showed a slide earlier on saying where is the greatest potential for decarbonization, right? And yeah. planners are at the forefront of that. But how do you get planners to put that? And how do you get le legislation to put that? Well, you have to get, as you were saying, the top political um, forces involved and make those mm -hmm. decisions. So mm -hmm. um, typically you need the senior stakeholders, both in local policy, like local government and, yep. and uh, central government to, yep. to be committed to this. And if you don't have that backing from a senior level, then you can't make those legislative or planning decisions. It's right. really, really, really difficult. Okay, well, um, challenges uh, abound on all of this subject. Can I thank uh, you two and all of our speakers? Um, uh, thank you very much for your contributions today. Um, uh, if we were together, we'd be clapping our hands and all that sort of thing. So you have to imagine the cacophony uh, of applause that would have accompanied um, that comment. But thank you anyway. Um, I think, and yeah, it's probably time for you to declare yourself. Um, and in fact, it'd be quite nice to see the team um, uh, because I quite like to see your faces so that we can say thank you. Uh, but we need to also um, uh, announce the, 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 the winner or winners of the Young Designer Competition. So um, I can now see uh, the results uh, which have been, so I think we can share these, can't we, Anya? So I'm going to hit the button here that says share results and um, you can all see now, I assume, 
this was the result of the poll that you all, about 70% of you took part in. Uh, so there's a big smile from Nora. Um, well done, Nora, team 10. Thank you. Uh, you seem to have uh, captured the imagination uh, and the, uh, the uh, support. Uh, well done the other two as well. Um, we, 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 of course, there, there was, a, 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 as it were, an official judging um, done in advance, uh, which first of all got you to the shortlist um, uh, and, and actually also looked uh, more closely at, uh, you know, winners and so on. And the judges I know had a really hard time to select just one um, winner. Um, uh, uh, so what we did, what they did, I should say, I was part of them, but what they did was to select two. Um, some may think that's copping out, but uh, there were nevertheless uh, two, two uh, winners. And indeed, Team 10 was one of them. So Nora, congratulations. Very, very Thank well you. done. Um, Thank you all. Very, very we well done. And so there you are. There's your certificate. We can hand it over to you with great ceremony. Uh, maybe when we do see each other at some point or when Ania uh, meets up with you or something, uh, you can actually have it and stick it on the wall. But many congratulations to Nora Andrea. Uh, uh, Nora and Andrea. Um, yeah, thank you. Can I see just two certificates because you've got an audience favourite and uh, one of the official ones, as it were. Uh, and the other team that um, the judges liked was Team Thirteen. So again, uh, well done to Raúl and your colleagues, colleagues. Lucas and Ruben. Uh, Raúl, Lucas, and Ruben. Um, thank you so much, and well done for you to you guys. Um, uh, there's your certificate. So congratulations. Let's stick it on the wall. Thank, thank, um, thank you very much. Uh, can, uh, thank you so much also to Giampiero, well done for getting on that shortlist. Um, sorry you. you didn't quite make it uh, this time, but uh, thank you so much for, for that. So, Thanks. Um, uh, I'm going to just close that window so I can see what's going on. We finish with that one. Um, can we now see the team? Because um, uh, perhaps speakers can turn your cameras off just so you could distinguish between organisers and speakers. Um, uh, that, uh, Paolo, you still got your camera on, but I think probably that's right. So, um, okay, we've got some speakers in here as well. But anyway, um, there we go, there we go. That looks, that, looks, that looks pretty close. Can I just ask you all, again, a cacophony of applause to, uh, to all of you guys who've been organizing this stuff. It's quite confusing as to who's who. But uh, in here, I know that you have been uh, doing a lot of work, Ansia, Panos, Vangelis. So lot, lots and lots of people. Thank you so much to you, Gordon. Yeah, there's two other members, yeah, and just to mention them that are uh, not here today. But not here today. I right. laugh and fought into it. But uh, it's been a lot of work. Um, and uh, But thank you so much, because without you guys, we wouldn't have been here. Thank you to all of you who have, have, have joined up, uh, as it were. We were up to 123, as, as, as I say, at, the, at maximum. We've 70 of you who've managed to stay to the end. Um, so well done. Just in closing, um, thank you to you, Ian. Thank you to Fernando also. Oh uh, uh, yes, yeah, Fernando, mention. of course. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, Fernando is our, he's heads up at the events um, side of things in the uh, British group way absolutely here. Um, we are so yeah. busy that uh, we, I needed to appoint somebody specifically to head up on the event side. Uh, Fernando, I know you're with us, at least you certainly were. Uh, let me just scroll up and see whether you still are. Uh, no, you've had to leave. He's probably in a busy meeting, Coe. Um, just briefly to finish, uh, to close in the last minute, um, please do um, have a look at our website. Please join, become a member of IABC. It's one of the best things you'll do. I joined it many, many, many years ago uh, when I had more hair and it wasn't so great. Um, and um, it was, it, you know, it has been a huge inspiration and valuable asset and resource for me throughout my, my professional career. Um, and, and, you know, it's a fantastic way of, of uh, learning from each other and, and building an international network. Um, follow us on, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, so look for IFC UK or whatever um, our handles are. I can't remember what they all are now, um, but you'll see them, of course, if you go to our website, ifc.org.uk. Because one of the things I wanted to mention, as I've mentioned it already today, we've talked a lot about carbon, we've talked a lot about the climate. Uh, I want to be running an event um, which is sort of following on from the Henderson event we had earlier this week, but focusing very much more on the younger. Um, side of our professions because um, it is you guys who are going to make the difference me and my lot we've made the mess okay i'm sorry to say it uh, we really have we've completely um, uh, messed up and uh, it's you and the people who are coming after you we need to raise the message again and again and again uh, even to our 
my grandchildren, uh, you know, age, they need to be understanding this problem because we've got a big job to do to solve it. So I'm going to organize an event um, which will be around the climate issue um, uh, at some stage. The way to get involved will be to keep an eye on our website. Uh, if you join up, you'll get obviously the specifically targeted focused newsletters and so on. So please do that. Uh, tell everybody about it and uh, join us when it happens. I don't know when it'll be, but it'll happen because it must. Well, one more thing to mention, um, I think it's been asked a couple of times whether or not this is recorded. It has oh, yeah, been recorded you. and it will be shared when um, edited. Do we have the um, contact details for the people who have joined us? Yes. We do. Marvellous. Fabulous. Good. So in which case I'm expecting to see at least another 66 uh, members of IABSI uh, in a week or two. Um, do join up. Uh, but thank you for joining us and thank you again to the team and our speakers. Goodbye and thank you. Uh, have a good lunch. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.